It pretty much felt like the world of Azeroth had never known anything but fighting and battles and stuff. You had the Troll Wars, and the Knoll Wars, and then some more Troll Wars. Then a rip in the very fabric of the universe brought Orcs to the world. Fought two wars against them. But now, the Alliance had at last managed to push the vast bulk of the Horde back to their own world. There were still a few renegade clans at large out in the wilderness, but the Alliance had rounded up what they could, put them in internment camps, and for the first time in many, many years, lasting peace looked like a thing that could actually happen. However, the senior council members of the Kirin Tor remained a little bit less optimistic, and the six of them were currently having a brain trust meeting. Something is happening in Kazmadan, near or in the caverns held by the Dragonmore clan. Tell us something we don't know. The orcs there remain one of the few holdouts now that Doomhammer's warriors surrendered and the chieftain's gone missing. Very well. Perhaps this will interest you more. I believe Deathwing is on the move again. Deathwing is dead. This very council and a gathering of our strongest struck him down months ago. The unidentified heavyset wizard was not lying or mistaken. As far as he was concerned, they had killed Deathwing. After all of his eggs were destroyed, and his battle with Gruul and the Sons of Lothar on Draenor, Deathwing had cheesed it back to Azeroth, only to then be attacked by a whole bunch of Kirin Tor peeps. And at the end of that battle, he plunged into the sea and disappeared. Definitely dead, nothing to worry about. Did you see the corpse? Deathwing was like no other dragon. Even before the goblins sealed the adamantium plates to his hide, he was a far greater threat than that of the Horde. But what proof do you have of his continued existence? The death of two red dragons, torn asunder in a manner only one of their own kind, one of gargantuan proportions could have managed. There are other large dragons. You've obviously never seen the work of Deathwing, else you'd never make that statement. It may be as you say, and if so, a matter of import. But we can hardly concern ourselves with it now. If Deathwing lives and is striking out at his greatest rival's kind, that surely benefits us. After all, Alex Straza is still the captive of the Dragonmoor clan. It is her offspring that the orcs used to wreak havoc and bloodshed against us. Have we also soon forgotten the tragedy of the Third Fleet of Colteris? I suspect Lord Admiral Proudmoor hasn't. After what happened to Derek. No one argued that point. Not even Antonidas. And as I stated earlier, we can hardly concern ourselves with that situation. Not with so many more immediate issues of which to deal with. You're referring to the Alterac crisis? Why should the constant sniping of Lordaeron and Stromgard worry us more than Deathwing's possible return? Because now, Gilneas has thrown its weight into the situation. The rest of the mages stirred at that news. At what interest is that sorry piece of land again Greymane? Gilneas is at the tip of the southern peninsula. Alterac is not exactly nearby. You have to ask. The only reason Greymane ever encouraged King Terranus to action was to weaken Lordaeron's military might. The first war took a toll on Lordaeron, whilst Gilneas only ever provided token support. Now that we have peace, Terranus' hold on the Alliance leadership is tenuous at best. Thoris Trollbane believes that his kingdom deserves to claim Alterac. Terranus wants to install a new and more reasonable monarch, presumably one with a sympathetic ear to Lordaeron's causes. Greymane has taken in one of Lord Perinald's own nephews, and is supporting his claim as Alterac's successor. And if Greymane is successful, Gilneas will gain access to resources they did not previously have, and an excuse to send its mighty ships across the Great Sea, which in turn would bring Kol Tiras into the equation, as they're very protective of their naval sovereignty. That would tear the Alliance apart. It has not come to that point yet, but it may soon. And so, we have no time to deal with dragons. If Deathwing lives and has chosen to renew his vendetta against Alexstrasza, I for one will not oppose him. The fewer dragons in this world the better. Their day is done, after all. The Sixth Mage, who had been completely silent up to this point, then piped up. I have heard that once the elves and dragons were allies, even respected friends. Tales only, I can assure you. We would not deign to traffic amongst such monstrous beasts. I appear to have heard wrong then. My mistake. You're right about the importance of calming the political situation down. I agree it must take priority. But still, we cannot afford to ignore what is happening around Kazmadan. Whether I'm right or wrong about Deathwing, as long as the orcs hold the Dragon Queen captive, they are a threat to the stability of the land. We need an observer then. Someone to maintain watch over matters. Alert us if the situation there becomes critical. But who? We've no one to spare. Again, the very unassuming Sixth Mage spoke up. There is one. Ronan. Ronan! After his last debacle, you want to send in the dirty hurry of wizards? He's a maverick. Unpredictable. He's a knob. The Sixth Wizard waited until everyone had stopped yelling out their distaste for Ronan before nodding. 
and he's the only skilled wizard we can afford to be without at the moment. This is simply a mission of observance, yes? He'll be nowhere near any potential crisis. Plus, I'm certain he's learned his lesson. Let us hope so. He may have achieved success in his last mission, but it cost most of his companions their lives. That's why, this time, we send him alone. A guide will take him to the edge of Alliance-controlled lands. A sphere of seeing will enable Ronin to watch from a distance. It does seem simple enough, even for Ronin. Fine, let us agree on this and be done with the topic. Perhaps we'll get lucky. Deathwing will swallow Ronin and choke to death. Now, can we finally focus on the political situation facing the Alliance? A short while later, Ronan. The young red-haired human wizard opened his eyes and stood up. The voice had come from everywhere, but also somehow nowhere within his chamber. What do you want? I've been waiting. The sixth wizard from the previous brain trust then emerged. It could not be helped. I had to wait myself until the matter was brought up by someone else. And my penance? Is my probation over? Yes. You've been granted your return to our ranks, on the provision that you complete a task. I've that much faith left in me, after the others died. You're the only one available. That sounds more realistic. Should've known. Here, take these. The shadowy wizard handed Ronin two objects. One, a shiny sphere of emerald. The other, a ring of gold, with a simple black jewel. I recognize the sphere of seeing, but not this other thing. Feels powerful, but not, I'm guessing, in an aggressive manner. Your astuteness is why I took up your cause in the first place, Ronin. The ring will serve as protection. You go into a realm where Orc Warlocks still exist. This ring will help shield you from their devices of detection. Regrettably, it will also make it difficult for us to monitor you. So I'll be on my own then. Well, less chance for me to cause any extra deaths, I suppose. You'll not be completely alone. At least as far as the journey to the port. A ranger will escort you. Ronin nodded, but you could clearly see he didn't care much for any escort. Especially a ranger. Ronin didn't exactly get on well with elves. You've not told me my mission. They've not been easy on you, Ronin. Some of the council even considered dismissing you entirely from the Kirin Tor. You're going to need to earn your way back. And to do that, you need to fulfill this mission to the letter. So it's not an easy task, then. It involves dragons. Dragons? Balls. Make no mistake about this, Ronin. No one else must know about this mission outside of the council and yourself. Not even the ranger who guides you, or the captain of the ship that will drop you at shore. If word got out, it could set all the plans in jeopardy. Just tell me what it is already. You are to go to Kazmadan, and once there, set in motion the steps necessary to free the Dragon Queen Alexstrasza. Farisa Windrunner did not like waiting. Most people assumed that elves had endless patience, what with them being so long-lived and virtuous. But that was a load of bollocks, at least for younger elves anyway. They were pretty much just as impatient as humans, and Verisa had now been waiting three bloody days for this frickin' wizard that she was expected to escort. Didn't help that she'd only been a full ranger for a year, and this was her first major assignment, to play nursemaid to some doddering old fart. <sighs> one more hour. If he's not here in one more hour, then sod this. Nee. What would have seemed to most people as a completely normal horse grunt, immediately set Verisa on alert, scanning her surroundings. Her mount didn't make that sound unless trouble was afoot, but she certainly couldn't see anyone. The woods seemed quiet, peaceful. Nee. Farisa glared at the horse, about to reprimand it for pissing about playing silly buggers when suddenly... You would be Verisa Windrunner, I presume. Within seconds, the stranger had the pointy end of an arrow at his throat. If Farisa chose to let it loose, it would no doubt shoot directly through, but for some reason, he seemed unimpressed. Farisa then looked the bloke up and down, not an entirely unpleasant task, she had to admit. Was this the wizard she'd been waiting for? That would certainly explain her mount's peculiar actions, and her inability to sense his presence. You are Ronin. Not what you were expecting. All they said was wizard. Well, all they told me was elven ranger. So I suppose we find ourselves even in this matter. Not quite. I've been waiting here for three days. It couldn't be helped. Preparations needed to be made. I had to procure a number of important items and supplies. Great. So this human was like all the other ones, then. Cared nothing for anyone but himself. How the hell did the Alliance ever triumph over the Horde, Farisa thought, with so many like this Ronin in their ranks? Well, if you wish to make your passage to Kazmadan, then it would be best if we left immediately. Farisa then peered behind the wizard. Where is your mount? She half expected him to reply that he didn't need a mount, and that he'd used his formidable powers to float here on a tiny cloud or some shit. 
tied near a trough by the inn, so we can drink some water. I've already ridden long today, milady. Farisa might have been flattered by the milady if it weren't so jam-packed full of sarcasm. This guy was irritating, but it wasn't worth getting into an argument before they'd even set off. So she turned to her horse and started to prep it for the journey. My horse could do with a few more minutes rest, and so could I. You'll learn to sleep in the saddle quick enough, and the pace I set at first will enable your steed to recoup. We've already waited far too long. There are very few ships endeared to the idea of sailing to Kazmadan simply for a wizard on observation duty. If we do not reach port soon, they may well have had a bit too long to think about it and change their minds. Thankfully, Ronin didn't argue, although he did frown. But he then turned, made his way back to the inn, leaving Verisa alone for a few moments with her thoughts. And she did indeed have a few thoughts. Firstly, she hoped she'd managed to escort this wizard bloke all the way to his destination without murdering him. And secondly, she wondered about his mission. Kazmadan remained a threat, that was true enough. But the Alliance had plenty of people capable of observing a place. People that weren't quite so arrogant. The fact that the Kirin Tor had sent this ticking time bomb of a guy suggested that there was more to this mission than they were letting on. However, Farisa very quickly shrugged those thoughts away. All she had to do was deliver Ronin to a ship. Then she could be on her way. This wasn't her concern. The two then journeyed for about four days, mostly in silence. Right up until Ronin leaned forward in his saddle and said, Are we nearly there yet? Three more days at least. But don't worry, our pace will now get us to the port on time. And Ronin leaned back again. So much for that conversation. The only thing worse than travelling with an elf, Ronin thought, would be travelling with a paladin. Or worse still, an elf and a paladin. God, that would be a mage's worst nightmare. The red-haired wizard then noticed that the sun was beginning to sink among the treetops. Great. He'd been hoping they'd reach the edge of the woods before dark, but apparently that wasn't going to happen. And if that wasn't bad enough, there was then a brief rumble of thunder. Hmm. Bit odd, he thought. There's not a cloud in the sky. Did you just hear th- Me. A second more menacing rumble then sounded, and without warning, Verisa leapt from her saddle, collided with the wizard and caused them both to tumble to the ground. Keep down. Don't move. But Ronin didn't listen. He twisted around so that he could see above, and watched in horror as a dragon, the colour of raging fire, consumed not only his horse, but also all of his carefully chosen supplies. The ones he'd spent three days gathering, that were of utmost importance to his entire mission. A figure, grotesque and green, sat atop the leviathan's back, then pointed at Ronin, and the beast followed its master's instructions, opening its maw wide and diving directly towards its prey. Meanwhile, I thank you again for your time, your majesty. Perhaps we can yet keep this crisis from tearing your good work asunder. If so, Lord Ron and the Alliance will have much to thank you for, Lord Prester. It's only because of your work that I feel Gilneas and Stromgard may yet see reason. For a young noble that no one had even heard of five years ago, Lord Prester had made quite a reputation for himself. He was charming, had a quick mind, full of the best advice. Terranus absolutely bloody adored him. So much so that he was seriously considering giving the bloke Alterac. That would be the best outcome for everyone, surely. You've much to be proud of, Prester, and much to be rewarded for. I'll not soon forget your part in all this, believe me. The young noble smiled, saluted, and then buggered off leaving Terranus to think further about how great he was. The King of Lordaeron even spent a few moments wishing his own son could be more like Prester, before another idea popped in his head. His daughter, Kalia. She was still a bit young, but in a few more years, he could strengthen his friendship with the Lord even further by offering her hand to him in marriage. Bloody great idea that was. But enough about how much Terranus loves Lord Prester. Lord Prester entered the chalet gifted to him by King Terranus, and he was absolutely beaming. Look at the smile on your face. Did someone die a grisly horrible death, oh venomous one? Spare me your witticisms, Krill. Most humble apologies, oh prince of duplicity. There was a hint of mischief and madness in Krill's voice, which wasn't surprising, considering he was a goblin. Still, I suppose there is somewhat of a reason to celebrate. Celebrate? Oh master of deceit? Yes. Prester's eyes then fixed on the goblin, who suddenly lost his smile and all semblance of mockery. I'm sure you'd be willing to do anything to be around to join in with those celebrations, wouldn't you, Krill? Yes, O oh master of secrets and sinister plots and stuff. Then stop talking like a wanker. Yeah, all right. The very disturbing smile then returned to Prester's face. Good. 
You are very likely looking at the next King of Alterac. Fair play. All hail his royal majesty King Death. Another goblin then rushed over, interrupting their conversation as it whispered something to Krill. What is it? It's, uh, it's your lucky day, master. What is it? Well, someone is attempting to free Alex Straza. Presta stared. For so long that Krill could feel his whole body physically start to shrivel. But the tall dark figure before him then burst out laughing. Perfect. So perfect. And they call me mad. Farisa cursed under her breath at the situation she now found herself in. If this Ronin bloke hadn't delayed the start of their journey, they'd be in Hasek by now. Not here, surrounded by dragon fire. It was also annoying because Lordaeron was actually a rather large realm, and dragons were few nowadays. So how the bloody hell had they been so unlucky to be found and attacked by one? She then glanced at Ronin. Oh, of course. Probably something to do with the fact that he's a wizard. Dragons had senses far above those of even elves. Some say they can even smell magic. This had to be Ronin's fault. And Ronin had evidently come to the same conclusion because he was now cheesing it into the woods. Pfft. Wizards. They might be effective from a distance, but on the front lines they're a goddamn liability. However, the dragon then veered to chase after Ronin, and Verisa felt her conscience twitch a little bit. She didn't like the guy, but she didn't want to see him dead. Unfortunately, her mount had also been taken along with his, and with it, her favoured bow. All she had was a sword, which wasn't exactly a fantastic weapon against the dragon. So she sighed, and did the only thing she possibly could do to try and save Ronin's life. Over here, you scaly twat! But the dragon didn't give a shit. Verisa's taunt failed to get any aggro whatsoever. The beast eyes remained very much fixed on the burning woods below, scanning for its wizard prey. So, Verisa threw a rock at it. A laughable weapon against a dragon's thick hide, but the intention wasn't to cause damage. It was to simply attract attention. And attract attention it did. Oh shit. Farisa then started to cheese it herself as the dragon roared and dived towards her. <laughs> she had no chance of outpacing her monstrous pursuer, and was immediately regretting her previous decisions, whilst simultaneously coming to terms with the fact that she was probably about to die. But, as is tradition in Warcraft novels, the Leviathan pulled back right at the last minute and started frantically scratching itself. Looked as if it was suffering from some incredibly painful itch, and the orc rider atop it was now holding on for dear life as the beast flapped about uncontrollably. Now would be a good time to leave, don't you think, Elf? Farisa turned to Ronin, who was looking a little bit dishevelled, but otherwise seemingly fine about the entire situation. But again, now was not the time to argue, so the two of them quickly attempted to flee. What did you do to it? Something that didn't turn out the way I planned. It was supposed to suffer a bit more than an intense irritation. Ronin actually sounded slightly annoyed with himself, but the ranger was still somewhat impressed. How long would the spell last? Until about now. The dragon was now hot on their trail again, and clearly intent on making them pay for whatever the hell just happened. Do you have another spell? Perhaps. I'd rather not use it here. It could take us with it. It's not like we have much choice, Ronin. How far to Hasek? Too far to run. Well, is there another settlement nearby? Farisa tried to think, slightly under pressure. Only one place came to mind. She couldn't remember the name of it, only that it was about a day's journey from here. Just use the damn spell! Fine. Just pray it doesn't backfire on us. Ronin's arms then flew up, hands pointed in the direction of the incoming dragon and he started to mutter words in a language that Verisa did not recognise. And then, three winged forms appeared through the clouds. Griffins, with little bearded muscly blokes on their backs. Verisa gasped and looked at Ronin with an eyebrow raised, and he looked at her and just kind of shrugged as if to say, yeah, that wasn't my spell at all, but whatevs. The griffins darted around the dragon, catching it by surprise, and a battle ensued. They're completely disorienting it. So we should probably leave then. But they might need our help. I've a mission to fulfill. They've got this covered. Verisa sighed, but he was probably right. The battle did seem to belong to the Griffin Riders. All right, let's go. A short while later. Curious. What is? Those ears aren't just for show then, are they? You what, mate? Sorry. Didn't mean that as an insult. Verisa didn't accept his weak attempt at an apology, but she forced her anger down. What's so curious? That this dragon appeared in such a timely fashion. I suppose. 
Well, those griffins and dwarves appeared in a pretty timely fashion as well, if you think about it. No. The dwarves were merely doing their duty. Some scout likely spotted the situation and they moved to respond. But the dragon? I wonder if... Ronin didn't finish that sentence. Because both he and Verisa then suddenly became very aware that they were not alone. A bunch of armoured figures burst from the woods and surrounded them. They carried no banner, but they did don tabards. Silver hand tabards. An elf. Your strong arm is welcome. But you, keep your hands where we can see them and we won't be tempted to cut them off. Meanwhile, two shadowy figures met in a place where dreams of the past played over and over. A place where two shadowy figures could have a conversation without anyone else being able to eavesdrop or something. One of the figures was the unassuming sixth mage from the first chapter, Ronin's patron. The other, who bloody knows? What do you want? For you to hear me out. For what reason? So you can repeat what you've said a thousand times before. So that for once, what I'm saying might actually register. Ah, <sighs> you've been around them much too long. It's time for you to abandon this hopeless task, just as we did. I don't believe it's hopeless. I cannot, so long as she is held. What she means to you is understandable, Coriel Strath. What she means to us is that of the memory of a time past. If that time is past, then why do you and yours still stand your posts? Because we would see our final years calm ones. Peaceful ones. All the more reason to join with me in this. The other figure hissed at that. Coriel Strath, will you never give in to the inevitable? Your plan does not surprise us. We've seen your little puppet on his fruitless quest. Do you honestly believe he can accomplish his task? Grace has paused for a moment before replying. He has the potential, but he's not all I have. No, I think he will fail. But in doing so, I hope that his sacrifice will aid in my final success. If you join with me, that success would be more likely. So I was right. The same old rhetoric. I came here because of the alliance once strong between our two factions. But clearly I shouldn't have bothered. You are without backing. Without force. It's just you. And you must hide in the shadows. In places such as this. Too scared to show your true nature. I do what I must. What is it that you do? What purpose do you exist for, my old friend? At that, the other figure started to leave. But before exiting entirely, I wish you the very best on this, Kari Alstras, I really do. I just don't believe that there can be any return to the past. Those days are done, and we with them. That is your choice then. But one request before you return to the others. And what is that? Do not ever call me by that name again. Ever. It must not be spoken. Even here. But no one could possibly. I said even here. Something in Krasis's tone made the other figure nod. And then they departed, leaving the Kirintor mage alone to reflect on how much of a waste of time that had all just been. Why were they all being such a bunch of jerks? Together they had hope. Divided they had nothing at all. Fools. Abysmal fools. The paladins brought Verisa and Ronin back to a keep. Surrounded by high walls and silver hand banners and stuff. Ronin didn't think it was very impressive, but he was in a bit of a bad mood anyway. Because although the paladins had been extremely pleasant and charming towards Verisa on the way here, they'd been rather rude to him. Treating him with only minimal civility, because their oath to King Terranus demanded it. But Ronin very much felt like a pariah amongst this group. Upon arriving at the keep though, their leader, one Duncan Centurus, turned to the elfin wizard and started to blow smoke up his own ass. We saw both the dragon and the griffins. Of course our duty and honour demanded that we ride out immediately. Yes, because rushing towards entirely aerial combat with a sword and shield is a brilliant idea, Ronin thought. But he didn't say it. Of course it would be remiss of us not to see you along the quickest and safest route to Hasek. I know it's a task you've been given, milady, but clearly it was chosen by a higher power that your path would lead you to us. A small party, led by myself, will journey with you come the morrow. This announcement seemed to please Verisa, but Ronan was a little bit pissed off. His worst nightmare had just come true. It's very kind of you, but Verisa's a capable ranger. We'll be fine on our own. Duncan's nostrils fled, as if he'd just got a whiff of shit or something. However, he maintained his smile. Allow me to personally escort you to your quarters, milady. Merrick, find a place to put the wizard. This way. Ronan turned to see a rather large knight looming behind him. All right, mustache. Lead the way. To be honest, Ronin was expecting to be led to some dank, foul place, but his room wasn't that bad. It was dry, clean, had walls. It would certainly do. 
And even better than that, the paladins actually left him alone, right up until evening meal time. At said evening meal, Ronan found himself sat quite far away from Verisa. It wasn't exactly subtle. She was placed pretty much at the head of the table, beside the commander, whilst Ronan was placed right at the other end. And although he would have quite happily finished his food and then buggered off quietly back to his room, the subject of dragons was then brought up. The flights have grown more common the past few weeks. More common and more desperate. The orcs must know their time is short and seek to wreak as much havoc as they can. They set upon the settlement of Darun just three days ago. More than half of its population gone, with the beasts and their masters escaping before the griffin riders could reach the site. Horrible. Indeed. But these incidents will soon be a thing of the past. Soon we shall march on the interior of Kazmadan, inside Grimbatol itself. We will end the threat of the last fragment of the Horde. Orc blood will flow, and good men will die. Although the wizard had muttered those words under his breath, the commander definitely heard it. Good men will die, yes. But we all swore an oath to Lordaeron, to free these lands of the Orc menace. And so we will, no matter the cost. <sighs> But before you can free the lands of the Orc Menace, you need to get rid of the dragons first, don't you? They will be vanquished, Spellcaster. Sent to the underworld where they belong. If you're devilish kind... At this point, probably because the atmosphere in the room was starting to get a little heated, Farisa gently touched Duncan's hand and gave him a smile. How long have you been a paladin, Lord Centaurus? And somehow, that worked. Ronin watched in amazement as the ranger transformed into some kind of enchanting young woman hanging on the paladin's every word, laughing and batting her eyelids and shit, which in turn completely disarmed the paladin commander. Her personality changed so much that Ronin could scarcely believe this was the same woman he'd spent the last several days with. Duncan then went into great detail about his own life. He was the son of a wealthy lord, chose the order to make a name for himself. He was a very honourable man, and also very intelligent, and also very, very, very modest. And despite the fact that the rest of the knights around the table had probably heard this story a million times, they all sat and listened, paying full attention. In fact, none of them even blinked, which just pissed Ronan off even more because this was the most mundane story he'd ever heard. And as Verisa sat there and gasped and said things like, Oh my, you're so brave, and enabled more of this boring story, Ronan decided enough was enough and buggered off. Once outside, Ronan thought about how much he was looking forward to reaching Hasek and setting forth on his journey to Kazmadan, because then he'd be done with paladins, and rangers, and any other useless fool that did nothing but interfere with his quest. No, he worked best alone, especially after that last mission. Other people don't bloody listen, he thought. No matter how many warnings you give them, they just charge head first directly into your spell and die. He did regret those deaths though. Each and every one haunted him, urged him on to more risky feats. Like, for example, attempting to solo Grimbatol and free the Dragon Queen. Nothing more risky than that. Deep down, Ronin knew he wasn't doing this just for the glory. He was doing it to appease the spirits of his fallen comrades, and perhaps finally stop feeling so goddamn guilty about it. Ronin then made his way up the Keep's walls and looked out at the woods beyond. Hmm, he could just leave. At least then he wouldn't have to listen to any more of Duncan's shit stories. That jerk seemed far more interested in Verisa than a Knight of the Holy Order should have been even if she does have beautiful eyes and a slender figure. Ronin then snorted and shook those thoughts away. What was all that about? Obviously his isolation during his penance had a bit more of an effect on him than he'd realised. Magic was his mistress, not some arrogant elf with beautiful eyes and a oh, for fuck's sake. Snap out of it, he thought. Best to turn your attention to more pressing matters, like those supplies the dragon ate. He was going to need to contact Krasis, inform him of what happened, see if he had any more spheres of seeing or protective rings to spare. So he grabbed a small dark crystal from his robe, held it up, muttered some words of power. However, he then stopped muttering words of power, because the stars in the sky disappeared, before reappearing a moment later. Okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. The wizard then tried again, raising the crystal high and muttering more words of power. What are you doing, spellcaster? Don't worry, it's nothing to- the sudden impact of the explosion against the wall caused the crystal to slip from Ronin's hand. He didn't have enough time to try and catch it, because he was too busy trying to make sure he himself didn't fall and plummet to his death. The sentry that had just interrupted his spell though, not so lucky. The wall itself then started to shake and collapse inward, so Ronin cheesed it towards the tower. But annoyingly, the tower itself then began to teeter, and before Ronin could react, 
and cast any kind of defensive spell, the ceiling came crashing down on top of him. Meanwhile, Necro Skullcrusher was mooching about, brooding and stuff, while staring at the golden disc in his meaty palm. It seemed to mock him. It always seemed to mock him. And he just couldn't bring himself to throw it away. Mainly because it was the only reason he was still respected at all within his clan. There was no glorious combat in his future. He had trained as a warlock when he was younger, but the way the warlock demanded he make choices he was not willing to make. So he'd return to his warrior ways, only to have his leg hacked off by a human in battle. Long story short, without this artifact, the demon soul, he was nothing. And that's his life story, now let's continue. Necros grunted, slowly raising himself to a standing position, and then hopped his way through the cavern corridors towards a massive chamber. I knew you would be here soon. There was disdain in Alex Strauss's voice, but Necros didn't care. Need anything? Death would be nice. Necros grunted and turned to inspect the Dragon Queen's latest clutch. Five eggs. A fair number, although they were a bit small. The last batch had been full of runts as well. This is useless, mortal. Your little war is all but over. Maybe. Or we'll still fight to the end, lizard. Then you shall do so without us. My last consort is dying. You know that. Without him, there will be no more eggs. Then we'll just have to find another. And how would you go about doing that? We'll just find one. And as for you, lizard... Necros grabbed the demon soul in his pocket firmly, but was then interrupted. Excuse this pitiful one's interruption, O oh gracious master. But words come you must hear. Oh, you must. Necros turned and rolled his eyes to see a little goblin wanker standing at the doorway. Speak then. There is a plan underway. One that will cause great disaster to the Dragonmore clan's dreams. What do you mean? The goblin then cocked his head towards the dragon. Perhaps elsewhere, gracious master. Necros picked up what the goblin was putting down. So it was probably a good idea not to discuss this news in front of Alexstrasza. Especially if it was as Necro suspected. Fine. This better be good, Krill. Trust me, Master Necros. Trust me. He had nothing to do with the explosion. Why would he do something like that? He's a wizard. They care nothing about the lives and livelihood of others. Farisa knew full well of the prejudices that the Holy Order held towards magic. So she knew there was no point in arguing. But as an elf, she'd grown up around magic. Even knew a little bit herself. Wizards weren't bad people. Sure, Ronin was reckless, bit of a jerk, but he'd already risked himself once to save her from the dragon. If he truly didn't care about the lives of others, he would have just left her behind, buggered off to Hasek, and never looked back. And if he's not to blame, then where has he gone? Why was there no trace of him in the rubble? If he was innocent of this, his body would have been there. No, this foul work is his fault, mark my words. So what? We're gonna hunt him down like an animal, Farisa thought. That seemed to be the plan, considering Duncan had summoned ten of his best to ride with them whilst they searched. Perhaps it was goblin sappers. They're well versed in sneaking up to fortresses and setting off deadly charges. No, this region has been swept clean of any trace of the Horde, goblins especially. All evidence points to Ronin, my lady. For his aside, Ronin was indeed the most likely source of the destruction, but she still couldn't believe it was him. He'd seemed so dedicated to fulfilling his mission. Setting off an explosion at a paladin's fortress and becoming a fugitive wasn't going to make that any easier for him. No, if they found Ronin, she was going to need to do everything possible to stop Duncan and his men from running the guy through without first hearing his side of the story. But several hours of fruitless searching later... Let's make camp. While I do not expect trouble, it shall do as little good to go wandering through the dark. With eyesight superior to that of her companions, Farisa considered continuing on by herself, but then thought better of it. If the paladins found Ronin without her, he was done for. So, she sighed, continuing to sweep the surrounding territory with her eyes, hoping to somehow spot the guy. He's nowhere about, Lady Verisa. I can't help looking, my lord. Well, we'll find the scoundrel soon enough. We should hear his story first, Lord Centaurus. It's only fair. The paladin commander shrugged. He will be given his chance to repent. Repent, meaning his guilt was already decided. And as soon as he'd done so, he'd be escorted back in chains and executed. Farisa then excused herself from the rest of the group in order to avoid saying something she might regret. And as she slipped in among the trees, she again felt the temptation to continue to search on her own. And then had a little flashback to a time shortly after her induction into the rangers. 
Always so eager to go rushing off and handle matters on your own, eh, Verisa? With such impatience, you may as well have been born a human. Keep this up and you will not be among the rangers for very long. Well, that was a crap flashback. Despite the skepticism of many of her tutors, Farisa had prevailed and risen to the top of her class. It's amazing how much of a motivator people doubting you can be, and how great it feels to make those doubters eat their words. But if Ronin was dead, then she failed her first ever assignment, meaning those doubters were in fact correct. And that idea made her feel sick to her stomach. However, a sudden gust of wind interrupted those thoughts, and Farisa stumbled a little bit. She then quickly hurried back to camp to see bedrolls and other objects strewn about, but the knights themselves were unharmed. What the hell was that? No idea, my lady. But it strikes me that no normal wind blows in such a manner. Roland, double the guard. Aye, my lord. Christoph, Jacob, get- Roland's voice cut off with such abruptness that both Duncan and Verisa half expected him to keel over with an arrow stuck in his head. But he was simply staring at a dark bundle lying amidst the displaced bedrolls. A dark bundle gradually recognisable as Ronin. He looked pale and still, and in the torchlight it was difficult to see whether he was breathing or not. But as Verisa knelt down and reached towards his face, his eyes flew wide open and startled everyone. Nice to see you again, Ranger. <laughs> Fool of a wizard! You can't just up and vanish after good men have died, reappear in our midst and then fall asleep. Duncan then reached down, intending to shake the wizard awake, only to let out a girlish squeal the moment his fingers touched the guy. Some sort of devilish unseen fire surrounds him. Despite Duncan's warning, Farisa had to see for herself, and sure enough, as her fingers touched Ronin's clothes, she too felt some weird warmth emanating from them. Nothing so intense as to warrant the girlish squeal from Lord Centaurus, though. However, she pulled her hand away and nodded. She wasn't going to embarrass the guy in front of his men. One of the knights then started to pull his sword from its sheath. No, Wexford. The knights of the Silver Hand do not slay a man in his sleep. It would stain our honour. We'll post guards for the time being and return in the morning. One way or another, justice will be served once he awakes. I'll stay. No one else needs to. Forgive me, my lady, but your association with... Farisa straightened and stared Duncan straight in the eyes. What, you think I'll help him flee again? Of course not. You have my permission. But to do so all night without relief, that is my choice. Would you do any less with one left in your charge? She had him there. The paladin commander hesitated for a moment before finally shrugging, and then turned to the rest of the warriors and ordered them all to bugger off. And within a few moments, the ranger and the wizard were alone. Farisa then examined Ronan as best she could without touching him. His robes were torn in places, his face covered in tiny scratches and bruises. But other than that, he seemed fine, apart from his facial expression. He looked absolutely drained, exhausted, handsome. Wait, what? The ranger shook that last thought away quickly. Ronin's sudden appearance was a bit questionable, although if he had used magic to somehow transport himself to the midst of their camp, that would have likely taken quite the effort, which would explain why he was now comatose. But no, for some reason that didn't ring true for Verisa. She couldn't shake the feeling that Ronin had been taken by someone, and then tossed back once the kidnapper got what they wanted. The only question was, who the hell could have done such a fantastic thing, and why? The following morning, Ronin woke up knowing that everyone was against him. Well, maybe not everyone. The elf might be alright, but everyone else, definitely against him. He excelled slightly, so as to not alert anyone to his consciousness. He needed a few moments to collect his thoughts and figure out how he was going to handle this. The first questions they'll probably ask are, did you cause the explosion, and where did you go afterwards? But he knew he couldn't delay any longer, so he did an overly dramatic stretch and pretended to wake up. Back among the living, are we? We'll see how long that lasts. He's only just opened his eyes. Give him time to eat breakfast before you question him. I will deny him no basic right, milady. But he shall answer questions during his breakfast, not after. Ronin propped himself up to see Duncan's angry face. I'll answer as best I can. But yes, only with food and water in my stomach. And so, Ronin was given some rations to eat, which he ate with gusto, because for some reason he felt like he'd been starved for a week. But as he wolfed down the food with little regard for manners, the paladin commander grimaced and watched on with distaste. And then, the questioning began. The time for confession is at hand, Ronin Redhair. You've filled your belly, now empty the burden of sin from your soul. Tell us the truth about your misdeed on the keep wall. I'll tell you what I know. 
Which is to say, not much at all, my lord. I stood atop the keep wall, but the fault of the destruction isn't mine. I heard an explosion, the wall shook, and one of your tin warriors had the misfortune to fall to his death, for which you've my sympathy. Duncan stroked his chin, looking as if he was fighting with every fibre of his being not to lose his temper. Your story already has holes as wide as the chasm in your heart, wizard, and you've barely even started. There were witnesses who saw you casting magic just before the devastation. Your lies condemn you. No, you condemn me, just as you condemn all my kind for merely existing. Yes, I cast a spell, but only one designed to communicate along distances. I sought advice from one of my seniors on how best to proceed with my mission, a mission that has been sanctioned by the highest powers within the Alliance. His words bear truth, Duncan. I see no reason why he would have caused such damage, and I will meet any man, including you in combat, if that's what it takes to restore his rights and freedom. Lord Centaurus looked disgruntled at the thought of having to face Verissa in battle, and then glared back at Ronin. Very well. You have a staunch defender, wizard. On her word and bond, I will accept that you are not responsible for what happened. But I would hear more about your experience during that time, especially the part about how you came to be dropped in our midst like a leaf fallen from a high tree. Ronin sighed. He'd been dreading this bit. I'll try to tell you all I know. Again, the weary wizard described his movements from the dinner table to the wall, his attempt to contact his patron, followed by the sudden explosion. I can't prove it beyond doubt, but it sounded like a charge being set off. Impossible. Duncan, perhaps the dragon that pursued us earlier. Maybe it brought one or two goblins with it. They're small, wiry, certainly capable of hiding for a day or two. That would explain much. <sighs> I suppose it would. And if so, we need to be doubly vigilant. Goblins know no other pastimes than mischief and destruction. If they truly are the culprits, then they will certainly strike again. Ronin continued, explaining that he'd then cheesed it into a nearby tower, but then paused, knowing for certain that Lord Centaurus would find his next words questionable at the very least. Something seized me, my lord. I don't know what it was. It took me up as if I were a toy and whisked me away from the devastation. It held me so tight I couldn't breathe. I must have passed out. And that's it? That's all you know? In a nutshell. You've told us nothing, wizard. Nothing of worth. If I thought for one moment... Duncan noticed a slight shift by Verissa, making him pause mid-sentence. But alas, I've given my word and taken that of another. We're already en route to Haysick. I see no reason why we shouldn't quickly move on and get you to your ship. We leave in one hour. Be prepared, wizard. And with that, the commander turned and stomped off, once again leaving the wizard and the ranger alone. Will you be well enough to ride? Besides exhaustion and a few bruises, I see him in one piece. Thank you, Verissa Windrunner. Without you, that definitely would have turned into an inquisition. It's my duty. I took an oath to my masters that I would see you to your destination. Better ready yourself, Master Ronin. This will be no mere canter. We have much time to make up. Verissa then left Ronin to his own devices. The ranger had no idea just how right she was in that last statement. The journey to Hasek was not going to be an easy gallop, and not just for the sake of time either, because Ronin had not been completely honest in his previous answer to Lord Centaurus. He hadn't lied, just failed to mention a particular conclusion he'd drawn. He didn't know who'd set the charge. That probably was goblins, but he didn't care. No, what bothered him was the giant hand that had saved him from the collapsing tower. It was no human hand. It had scaled skin and wicked curved talons. It was a dragon that had rescued him from certain death. And Ronin had no bloody idea why. I've little time to waste pacing around in these decadent halls. King Terranus slowly counted to ten before responding to Greymane's barking. Lord Prester will be here soon again. You know he wants to bring us all together in this matter. I don't know anything of the sort. You might as well tell the wind to stop howling, Terranus. You'd have more success there than getting Gen to keep quiet. If you don't like the sound of my voice, Lord Admiral, good steel can always make sure you never hear it, or anything else again. Dalen Proudmoor didn't like that, so he moved to unsheath his sword, only to suddenly remember that they'd all agreed not to carry arms into this discussion. But lucky for him, Terranus then interrupted the tension with an attempt to defuse it. My lords, gentlemen. Terranus then looked towards the stern figure standing by the window, hoping for a bit of assistance. 
Surely Thoris Trollbane would step in and help calm things down. But no, he just stood there. My lords, this behaviour is unseemly. Terranus then sighed in relief. Lord Prester had finally arrived. Thank goodness. Forgive my belated arrival. I'd ridden out to the countryside this morning, not realised just how long it would take me to get back. No need to apologise. Prester then surveyed the room. It's good to see you all again. And so, the talks began. There were a few heated words exchanged, but no further threats of violence thanks to Prester's presence. On several occasions during the Brain Trust, Prester would take one of the kings off and exchange a few private words, and at the end of the meeting it seemed to be Terranus's turn for such an exchange. I don't know how you did it. You've somehow made the others see the truth. The need. They're actually sat in this chamber acting civilly. I merely did what I could, my lord. But thank you for your kind words. Kind words? Hardly. Presto, you've single-handedly kept the Alliance from crumbling to bits. What exactly did you tell them all? Oh, a little of this, a little of that. Promises to the Admiral about his continued sovereignty of the seas, even if it meant sending in a force to take control of Gilneas. I spoke to Greymane about future naval colonies near the coastal edge of Alterac, and Thoris Trollbane now thinks he'll be ceded the eastern half of that region, all when I become its legitimate ruler. Terranus froze, mouth gaped. Had he heard that correctly? He continued to stare at Prester, waiting for some sort of punchline, but when he realised there was no punchline coming, he finally blurted out, Have you taken leave of your senses? Even jesting about such matters is highly outrageous and... And you will not remember a thing about it just as none of them will remember what I truly told them. All you need to recall, my pompous little puppet, is that I've guaranteed a political advantage for you, but only if I am appointed as ruler of Alterac. Now, scurry back to the others. Make your bold decision. Greymane will be the most reserved, but in a few days he'll agree. Proudmoor will follow your lead, and after mulling it over for a bit, Thoris Trollbane will also acquiesce to my ascension. Something nudged at Terranus's memory, a notion he felt compelled to express. No. No ruler may be chosen without the agreement of Dalaran and the Kirin Tor. They are members of the Alliance too. But who can trust a wizard? Who can know their agenda? That's why I had you leave them out of this situation in the first place, is it not? Wizards cannot be trusted. And eventually they must be dealt with. Dealt with? Of course. Preston's smile widened, revealing far more teeth than one would expect in a normal bloke's mouth. Now let's return to the others. You are very satisfied with my progress. In a few minutes you shall make your suggestion, and we shall move on from there. Yes. Prester then steered the king back to the others, and as he did, King Terranus's thoughts returned to him. Any memory of the conversation he'd just had lay buried, deep within his subconscious. Enjoying the brandy, my friends. Well, as a gift for your visit, I shall send a case back with each of you. All the kings cheered and whooped, and even toasted the monarch of Lordaeron. And that went on for a few minutes until, thanks to our young associate here, I think we'll all be leaving here closer in heart than we were before. We've not signed any agreement yet. We've not even agreed what to do about the situation. There it was. The opening. No better time for Terranus to make his announcement than now, he thought. I think I've hit upon the solution that will appeal to us all. And now we jump to another brain trust meeting. Only this time between wizards instead of kings. This isn't right. They've no cause to leave us out of this. No, they don't, but they have. This particular meeting only included five of the six wizards from the first chapter. Krasis had not arrived yet, but the other wizards were far too concerned with recent events to wait for him. The Alterac dilemma could have been resolved long ago. We should have insisted on our proper part in the proceedings. And start another incident? Have you not noticed the other realms pulled back from us of late? It's almost as if they fear us, now that the orcs have been pushed back to Grimbatol. Absurd! The untalented have always been suspicious of magic, but our faith in the cause is without question. When has that mattered to those who fear our abilities? Now that the orcs have been battered, the people begin to notice that we're not like them. We're superior in every way. A dangerous way to think. Even for us. Grace has entered the room and took his position. About time you got here. Did you find out anything? Very little. The meeting was unshielded, yet all I could read were surface thoughts. I had to resort to other methods to garner even some success. Well, have they made a decision? Gracious hesitated, and then raised his hand. Behold. In the centre of the room, an image of a tall human figure materialised. Majestic looking, elegant. Who is he? All hail the new ruler of Alterac. 
King Prester the First. What? That's outrageous. They can't do this without us. Who is this Prester? Grace had shrugged. A minor noble from the north. Dispossessed, without backing. Yet he seems to have ingratiated himself to all the kings in the alliance. But to make him a king himself? On the surface, it's not a terrible choice. He places Alterac as once more an independent kingdom. The other monarchs find much about him they respect. He seems to have single-handedly kept the alliance from falling apart. So you approve of him? He also appears to have no history. Apparently he's the reason we've not been included in these talks. And most curious of all, he appears as a void when touched by magic. The rest of the council all murmured for a few moments before the elven wizard piped up. Appears as a void? What do you mean? Any attempt to study him through magic reveals nothing. It's as if Lord Prester does not exist. You ask me if I approve of him? No. I think I fear him. Again, silence filled the air as each of the council members considered this information. And again, the youthful elven wizard broke said silence. So he's a wizard then. That would seem the most logical. And a powerful one. Also logical. Then if so, who? One among us? A renegade? Surely one of this ability would be known to us. I don't recognize his face. A formal announcement will take place in two weeks. After that, this Lord Prester will be crowned king a month later. We should lodge a protest. A start. However, what I think we really need to do is find out the truth. About who he is. Search every crevice and tomb and discover his past. We dare not confront him openly until then. Not whilst he has the backing of every other Alliance kingdom. The rest of the council seemed to agree with Krasis' assessment, and then more silence filled the air. I must depart again, but I suggest all of you do as I shall and think hard on this dire matter. Follow all trails and follow them swiftly. If the throne of Alterac is filled by this enigma, then I suspect the Alliance may not long stand firm, and I fear that Dalaran may fall with the rest if that happens. Because of this one man? Because of him, yes. Krasis then disappeared with a poof, only to appear in his own sanctum mere seconds later. He was pretty shaken by this whole situation, not to mention racked with guilt, because he too had not been completely honest with his companions. He knew, or rather suspected, far more about this Lord Prester than he'd let on. He wished he could tell them everything, but, assuming they didn't just think he was insane, telling them what he knew would only cause them to ask a few follow-up questions about him personally, like who he really was. But enough of that, Gracious took a seat, held out his hand and conjured a light blue sphere, and as he passed his other hand over the sphere, images started to form within it. Images of King Terranus's throne room, where the king and his youthful protege stood. The rest of the Alliance kings must have said their goodbyes and departed from the previous brain trust meeting, but Lord Prester himself had stayed behind. For a moment, Krasis felt tempted to try and probe the bloke's mind, but thought better of it. If he truly was as powerful a wizard as they suspected, Prester would no doubt notice such an attempt, and Krasis couldn't risk alerting the guy just yet. No. A better idea would be to search Prester's chateau, the one gifted to him by Terranus. And since Prester was currently out of said chateau, now would be the perfect time to do that. So, Krasis moved his hand over the little blue sphere once again, and the images within shifted to said chateau's exterior. There were a few defensive spells, which Krasis had been expecting, but they were nothing too complicated to bypass. It was only a few moments before Krasis's little probe could enter the building and, however, the sphere then blackened and that blackness then started reaching out beyond the edges of the sphere, grasping at Krasis himself. The Master Wizard quickly threw himself from the chair and turned to see tentacles of purest night completely envelop the seat and devour it. It cannot be. As the black tentacles continued to expand and grow, Krasis knew what he faced. This was the Endless Hunger, a forbidden spell from a time long past. The best mages humanity and even the elves could offer would lack the skill and knowledge to cast such a complex thing. And the worst thing about the Endless Hunger, no matter where Krasis went in the world, these tentacles would grow and expand and chase him forever, which really only left him one choice. So he carefully pronounced each word of power, thrust his hand out, and just as a single tentacle lashed out and wrapped itself around a few of his fingers, boom. When the light dissipated, Krasis found himself lying in the fetal position on the floor, blood pooling from his hand. The spell had cast out the Endless Hunger, but not before the bugger had devoured a couple of his fingers. Krasis then spent the next few minutes angrily yelling a whole bunch of words that would get this video demonetized before finally dragging himself to his feet. He had mixed feelings. On the one hand, he was pretty happy, because he triumphed against such a devastating powerful spell, but on the other hand, he had less fingers now. 
But as he observed the damage wrought by that foul spell, a realisation hit him. Yes, he'd failed to probe Lord Prester's chateau, but the fact that Prester had booby-trapped it with the endless hunger told him everything he needed to know. I know you now, despite that form you wear. I know you, Deathwing. After a day or so of travelling, Duncan, Ronan, Verissa and the rest emerged from the woods to see Hasek lying in the distance. However, the paladin commander immediately reined his horse to a halt. Something is wrong here. Ronan had felt it too. It was quiet. Too quiet. Considering Hasek was a port town, it should have been absolutely bustling with noise. Yet, other than a few birds, there was no sound of life whatsoever. Maybe we're just over-anxious because of the trek. After a few more moments of just kind of sitting there staring, Ronin decided to take matters into his own hands and spurred his horse forward. He was going to make it to Hasek with or without the rest of them. But Verissa then quickly followed, with Lord Centaurus naturally hurrying after her. And then finally, the rest of the Silverhand Knights moved as well. And Ronin couldn't help but smile as the Paladins caught up with him and then took the lead, as if they hadn't been the last ones to make a decision. He was really looking forward to parting ways with these arrogant, pompous jerks. However, as the group drew nearer to the town, that feeling of wariness only grew stronger. Even their mounts were growing more and more tentative. And then, Ronin spotted three ominous forms take flight and head directly towards them. A bit of panic befell the entire group for a moment or so, but the paladin commander signalled them all to sheathe their swords and calm the hell down, because the ominous forms approaching were merely griffins. Who raids to Hasek? Hail to you, Griffin Rider. I am Lord Duncan Centaurus, of the Order of the Knights of the Silver Hand. I lead this party to the port. If you will permit a question, has some misfortune befallen Hasek? <laughs> if you can call a pair of dragons just a misfortune, then yeah. They came three days ago. If we hadn't arrived when we did, there'd be nothing left. A glorious battle it was, though we lost Glod in that day. May his spirit fight proud through eternity. Ronin quickly interjected, fearful that these dwarves were about to break into one of their epic songs of lament. We saw a dragon about three days ago, with an orc handler. Some of your griffin riders came and fought it. The lead dwarf had initially scowled at Ronin as soon as he opened his mouth, but at the mention of said battle, his eyes lit up. Aye, that was us as well, human. A good and dangerous fight that was too. Moloch here, he lost a fine axe, but at least he still has his hammer. Here, Moloch. Where's well, gonna get my hair with him? Yeah, everything we're in Glasgow. Aye, tis the hammer that impresses the ladies the most. The dwarf then seemed to notice Farisa for the first time. And here's a fine elven lady now. Falstad Dragon Reaver, at your service. Ronin then recalled learning about how the elves of Quelthalas were some of the only other people that the dwarves of the Ares truly trusted. But that didn't seem to be the only reason why Falstad was now seemingly fixated on the elven ranger. It seemed like bloody everyone found her attractive. My greetings, Falstad, and my congratulations on a victory well fought. Two dragons are much for any flight group to claim. All the day's tasks were mine, all the day's task. We've not been graced by any of your folk in this area though, especially not so fine a lady as yourself. In what way can this poor warrior serve you best? Ronin felt the hair on the back of his neck bristle. This dwarf's tone suggested he was offering something more than simple assistance, like a bit of boob play or something. Ronin knew such things shouldn't bother him, but for some reason every bloke in this chapter is a jealous maniac, because Duncan Centaurus obviously felt the same way as well, answering before anyone else even could. Your offer of aid is appreciated, but not necessary. We have but to reach the ship that awaits this wizard, so that he may be on his way from our shores. Duncan's words made it sound like Ronin had been exiled from Lordaeron completely, so the frustrated mage quickly added, I'm on an observation mission for the Alliance. We've no cause to stop you from entering Hasek and searching for your vessel, human. But you'll be lucky to find one. Well, I still have to look. Then we'll be out of your way. A definite pleasure, my elven lady. And with that, the Griffin Riders rose up and buggered off. Let us ride. We may still find fortune on our side. Without another word, the group rode towards the port, immediately discovering that the town of Hasek had suffered far more than Falstad had let on. Stronger structures with stone bases had withstood the onslaught, but anything less than that had been completely demolished, and the air itself was full of the stench of burnt matter. Not everything the two dragons had charred had been made of wood, but curiously, some of the areas near the harbour itself looked entirely intact, which raised Ronin's hopes a little bit. Perhaps the ship survived after all? I don't think so. Not if that's any sign. Farisa pointed out towards the sea itself, and Ronin squinted. It's the mast of a ship, spellcaster. The rest of the vessel and her valiant crew now likely reside below the water. Bulls. 
As Ronan surveyed the harbour and ocean, he now saw bits and pieces of wood completely dotting the surface. Flotsam from more than a dozen ships. Your quest is ended, wizard. You've failed. There may yet be a boat. And who here will sail to Kazmadan for your silver? These poor wretches have suffered through enough trials. Do you expect some of them to set sail willingly to a land still held by the very orcs who did this? I can only try and find out. I thank you for your time, my lord, and wish you well. Ronin then turned to the elven ranger. And you as well, Theresa. You're a credit to your calling. I'm not leaving you yet, but your task is incomplete. I cannot in good conscience leave you here with nowhere to go. If you still seek a way to Kazmadan, I shall do what I can to help you. Duncan suddenly straightened and changed his tune. Uh, and we cannot leave matters so either. By our honour, if you believe this task still worthy of continuation, then the Knights of the Silver Hand will do all we can to assist. Freeze's decision to remain had pleased Ronin, but Duncan's offer just pissed him off. I thank you, my lord, but there's many in need here. Wouldn't it be best if your order helped the good people of Haysik? Please work, please work, please work, Ronin thought to himself. Your words do have merit for once. But I think both your mission and Haysik can benefit from our presence. My men will aid the citizens in recovery efforts. I will personally help you find a craft. Yes, what a good idea I just had. Great, thanks. So, the senior paladin sent his men on their way, and then the three named characters spent a little bit of time discussing how best to go about their search. They soon agreed that they should split up to cover more ground, and they'd meet back here later to discuss their findings. Ronin headed to the northern area of the port. The dragons had been pretty thorough though, and as the day waned, he'd found absolutely nothing. So the wizard started to consider other options. There were methods for a mage to travel great distances instantaneously, but only folks like Medivh had ever used that sort of spell with confidence. If Ronin were to try and teleport to his destination, he would not only risk possible detection by an orc warlock, but also there was the potential for him to materialise directly above an active volcano which would be a pretty embarrassing way to die. Ronin then noticed there were a few Haysik residents, gathered by some nearby wreckage, kind of staring at him. The look on their faces almost seemed like they blamed him for what had happened here, as if he was somehow responsible for the attack. Even now, in such dire conditions, these common folk could not get past their preconceived prejudices and fears of his kind. The next thing Ronin observed were a couple of griffins flying overhead, obviously maintaining watch for another attack, but Ronin doubted there would be another one. Not any time soon, anyway. Faustad and his men would be better served down here, Ronin thought, helping these people. But the wizard suspected the dwarves likely preferred to stay aloft and aloof. Hell, the only reason they were even still here was because they enjoyed the fight, and they were desperately hoping for another one. That's it! Who else but the dwarves would be insane enough to take him up on his offer? Why had it taken him this long to realise that was an option in the first place? So, Ronin went ahead and ran as fast as he could, chasing after the griffin riders. Meanwhile, Verisa stood at the southernmost part of the docks. She too had been unsuccessful in discovering anything suitable to help Ronin make his journey. She kind of desperately wanted to just go home, back to her own people. But as she'd said, she couldn't in good conscience just leave him, especially now that she was absolutely convinced he was not just on some simple observation mission. No, he was way too determined to see this thing through. What the bloody hell kind of mission was he really on, she wondered. Hello again, my beautiful elven lady. Marisa turned to see Falstad, eyes wide and a big grin on his face. Master Falstad, greetings to you. Please, just Falstad. I'm master of nothing save my own wondrous fate. How goes your quest to set the wizard on the water? I imagine not good. No, not good at all. A pity. Say so we should discuss this further over a flagon of spirits. What do you say? Another time, perhaps. I still have a task to fulfil, and you seem to have your own thing going on. Falstad swung the little sack he was carrying on his shoulder around. What, this little thing? Eh, it's just some supplies. I could hand these to Moloch, and then you and I could go. An angry squawk then filled the air, setting both Verisa and Falstad on full alert, and they quickly made their way towards the source of the noise, only to find some griffin riders being accosted by a wizard. <laughs> Moloch! What's this spellcaster done that so enraged you? Hey, och. We are here in Glasgow. What is going on? I came to them with a simple request, that's all. We are in ruin, I guess. I thought them capable and daring enough. Evidently, I was wrong. 
If you're even suggesting that we're cowards, human, I'll drop you off a cliff. There's no mightier warriors than the dwarves of the airy peaks. We do not fear the orcs or the dragons of Grimbatol. We just care not to suffer the touch of your kind any more than necessary. Theresa expected fury from her charge and was surprised to see him just kind of purse his lips instead. I'm on a mission for Lordaeron. That's all that should matter. But I see now that it doesn't. Wait. Falstad, is there no hope at all that you might take us as close as possible to Grimbatol? If not, then Ronan and I are surely defeated. I thought the wizard was travelling alone. And what would his chances be the first time he faced a strong orc axe? He might handle one or two with his spells, but if they came close, he'd need a good sword arm. Falstad considered this. She did have a good sword arm. For him, I'd do very little. But for you, and the Alliance, I'd be more than willing. Moloch. Haggith. Tis for the good of the war, brother. Think of the daring you can boast about. That sentiment alone seemed to somewhat appease Moloch. Yeah, my own lady will read with ye. I am flight leader. My rank demands it. Moloch nodded, his facial expression somehow being a smirk but also scowl at the same time. Wonderful. Once more the dwarves of the airy peak come to the rescue. This calls for a drink. Farisa could see Ronin would have preferred to take his leave at this point, but she'd just secured him his method of reaching Kazmadan. Least he could do would be to join them for a drink as well. We should be happy to join you. Isn't that so, Ronin? Very much so. Excellent. Is the tavern still intact? It should be able to scrounge up a few casks of ale. The dwarves all high hoed their way towards the bar, giving Ronin a moment to have a little chat with the ranger. What are you thinking? Only I am heading to Kazmadan. You wouldn't even have a chance to get there if I hadn't told them I was going with you. You don't know what you're getting yourself into, Verisa. Then tell me. You're planning something, aren't you? Ronin was just about ready to actually answer that question when the two of them realised Duncan Centaurus had appeared at some point and was staring at them. We'll talk of this when we've more privacy, Verisa. But know this. When we reach the shores of Kazmadan, I and only I will continue on. You'll be returning with our good friend Falstad. And if you even think of going any further... Ronin's eyes then fled. Literally. I'll send you back here myself. Back in Grimbatol, Necro's Skullcrusher was standing around moping again. He'd known this day would come. Ever since Doomhammer and the bulk of the Horde were defeated, it was only a matter of time before the Alliance set their sights upon Kazmadan. If the Goblin Krill was to be believed, and he had no reason to lie or anything, then the humans were finally making their move to either release or destroy the Dragon Queen and weaken the Orcs so that the Alliance could achieve their final victory. Krill hadn't exactly been specific. He hadn't mentioned how many the Alliance were sending, so Necros naturally envisioned an entire army amassing at their borders, with knights and rangers and wizards and all of the things. Necros then hobbled through the halls, entering a chamber where a bunch of dragon riders were mooching about. However, he couldn't see the particular warrior he was looking for. Where's Torgus? Some of the orcs looked his way for a brief moment before grunting. Well, say something, or I'll start feeding body parts to the Dragon Queen. Here, Necros. Torgus then entered the room, walking towards his superior with the bristling confidence of an orc champion. What do you want, old one? For you to do your bloody job? I've got a mission for you. What kind of mission? If it's just scorching more worthless human peasants, then send one of the grunts. Well, how about something that includes soldiers? And maybe a wizard or two? Torgus's eyes then narrowed with intrigue. Tell me more. Meanwhile, Ronin was bloody furious. It was bad enough that he had to spend time with a bunch of dwarves that clearly hated him. Worse still, that Verisa had decided that she needed to tag along to Kazmadan now. And it turned out Lord Centaurus had caught wind of the plan and convinced Falstad to take him with them as well. At this rate, with all of these extra useless comrades joining his quest, there was no doubt in Ronin's mind that a second catastrophe was inevitable. Something he'd desperately been trying to avoid. This is insanity. There's no need for anyone else. However, the rest of the group just completely ignored his protests. They didn't care what he thought. In fact, Faustad even shot Ronin a look that suggested if he continued to moan, they'd leave him behind and go to Kazmadan without him. Which didn't make any sense whatsoever, but whatevs. The dwarves continued to prep the griffins whilst Duncan head over to his men handing a medallion to his second and passing on his orders. And Ronin kind of wondered what the hell that was all about, which Farisa obviously noticed. Duncan has handed Roland the seal of his command. If anything happens to the Lord, Roland will permanently ascend. The Knights of the Silver Hand take no chances. 
Ronin turned to try and ask Verisa a follow-up question, but she'd already stepped away again. Things had been a little bit awkward between the two of them ever since he threatened her. Plus, that whole conversation was basically just foreshadowing anyway, so no need for them to say anything else. It's time. Is everyone ready? I am prepared. As am I. Then let us mount. First, I then extended a hand to Verisa and flashed her a jovial smile. My elven lady. Verisa smiled back to the dwarf and jumped on the back of his griffin. And Ronin fought very hard to maintain an expression of indifference on his face. He kind of wished he was riding with anyone but Falstad, but to comment so would make him look like a fool. <laughs> Ronin had no idea what Moloch had just said, but he assumed it was something along the lines of get on my griffin, so he did that. And off they went. It was a bit terrifying at first, especially since Ronin had never actually ridden one of these things before. With every flap of the creature's wings, Ronin's stomach jumped up and down violently. This was not fun. He had to admit though, these beasts certainly flew with incredible swiftness. How long do you think before we reach Kazmodan? <laughs> Again, Ronin didn't catch a word of Moloch's answer and kind of wondered why he'd bothered asking in the first place. But after several hours of flying, Moloch started to point off to the distance and yet out a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Ronin had actually nodded off, but as he opened his eyes, he saw two dark specks on the horizon. Land. Now that they were so close, new life and enthusiasm arose within Ronin. Kazmodan. They'd made it. It would only be a short time before they touched down and... However, two other dark specks then formed on the horizon. These ones moving, growing larger and larger, and getting closer and closer. Dragons! The Griffin Riders immediately adjusted their formation, spreading out so as to become smaller, more difficult targets. Falstad seemed to move to the rear of the group, no doubt due to the fact he had Verisa accompanying him, whereas the Griffin that was carrying Lord Centaurus appeared to charge forward, ahead of everyone else. Ronin could hear the excitement in Moloch's voice, excitement that he didn't exactly share. Dying here would throw a bit of a spanner in the works to his overall mission. We can't fight them. Get me to shore. Moloch grunted his frustration and started to argue. Neeps and tatties. Whatever it is you're saying, my mission comes first. Moloch pulled a face that suggested he was seriously considering throwing the wizard off his griffin, but then relented. Yeah. But that pointless conversation then came to an abrupt end because the griffins and the dragons then collided. The griffins were more agile than the dragons, but some of them were burdened by extra weight. And those ones seemed to be the dragon's prime targets. A number of attacks from the first dragon very nearly took out Duncan and his companion, whilst the second dragon seemed very much intent on destroying Falstad and Verisa. And as Ronin watched said dragon get closer and closer to them, he suddenly felt like his mission did not come first. Moloch, go after that large one. We have to help them. A huge grin then formed on Moloch's face. Didn't need to tell him twice. He immediately steered his griffin towards the fight, and within moments, they'd reached their target. Moloch attempted to smash the dragon's rider with his storm hammer, whilst Ronin unleashed a bolt of lightning. And as it struck the creature, it shrieked with pain, whilst the orc rider atop it slumped forward in his seat. They were stunned which gave Verisa and Faustad an opportunity to escape the immediate danger. And that seemed to be enough for Ronin because he now felt like his mission came first again. To the shore, quickly now. Again, Moloch looked disappointed and moaned a bit, but he reluctantly steered his griffin away. But the second dragon wasn't done with them yet. After recovering from being stunned, it gave chase. And as it drew closer, it opened its maw wide, intent on swallowing them whole. And it would have bloody succeeded too, if it weren't for that pesky Duncan Centaurus. Ronin watched, mouth gaped, as the paladin commander leapt from his griffin towards the second dragon. What an absolute mad lad. Centaurus landed somewhat safely on the beast's back, but he didn't have a lot of time to get his bearings because the orc rider immediately sprang into action, raising his axe and striking the paladin from behind, slicing a huge gash in the poor bloke's back. Without hesitation, Ronin unleashed a firebolt across the sky towards the orc and hit it, which caused the dragon rider to lose his grip on his giant mount and fall off the side. The wizard then immediately turned his worried gaze back to the paladin, who in turn glanced back with an expression that almost seemed like gratitude and respect. But also, it was pretty obvious Duncan was in extreme agony, and probably going to die. Duncan then used basically all of his remaining strength to pick himself up, raise his blade, and bury it deep into the neck and skull of the dragon itself. The dragon screamed and began to spin uncontrollably, causing Lord Centaurus to drop off the side. However, he was no doubt already dead, from the axe wound in his back. This was exactly what Ronin had feared. He'd lost yet another companion, 
Sure, they weren't exactly best friends, but when a guy literally jumps from a griffin to a dragon and saves you from being eaten, you tend to retrospectively appreciate them a bit more. Unfortunately, Ronin wasn't really able to feel sorry for himself for very long, because the presumably dying dragon's wings then fluttered erratically, slapping Moloch's griffin. Both the dwarf and the wizard were sent flying off their mount, and were now plummeting rapidly down to the murky depths below. Ronin tried to desperately think of a spell that would solve this new predicament, but the impact from the dragon's wings had dazed him somewhat. So this was it then. He was going to die. He hadn't made it to Kazmadan after all. Darkness then began to overwhelm him. A darkness he'd initially assumed was him blacking out. But from the darkness suddenly came a booming voice. I have you again, little one. Never fear. Cliffhanger. Duncan! It is too late, my elven lady. Your man's already dead. What a glorious tale to leave behind. Farisa did not care about glorious tales. What she cared about was that a brave man she had come to know all too briefly had died. The only comfort being that he'd managed to take one of the two dragons with him. However, the other dragon was still very much a threat. They could not remain here. Faustad quickly urged his griffin to dive in order to avoid the remaining creature's snapping jaws. It definitely seemed to be completely fixated on them specifically. And whilst Farisa held on for dear life, she couldn't help but wonder whether these beasts had come because of Ronin's mission. And it was in that moment that she realised she'd completely lost sight of the wizard a while ago. I don't see Ronin. I worry for another time. It is more important that you hold tight. Again, Falstad pulled a sudden swift manoeuvre, so it was a good thing Verisa had been holding tight. Otherwise she would have been thrown off the bloody thing. But in doing so, they managed to avoid yet another attack from the pursuing dragon. Prepare for a battle, my elven lady. It appears we may have any other choice. Faustad then unsheathed his storm hammer, whilst Farisa cursed the loss of her bow. But, just before they and the dragon collided for an epic battle, a colossal form the colour of night dropped in among them. What in the name of... T'was another dragon, of immense proportions, and for some reason it was snapping at the smaller red one. Deathwing. That orc is either brave beyond compare, a fool, or without any control over his beast. If it were me, I'd not remain in such a fray. Some other griffin riders approached, and Verisa immediately scanned each of the newcomers. However, there was still no sign of Ronin. Moloch is dead. His mount lies drifting in the sea. But what about the wizard? I think tis obvious, my lady. Verisa clamped her mouth shut, knowing the dwarf probably spoke the truth. If Moloch's griffin had taken a tumble, hitting the ocean's surface below from this height would have been like slamming into solid rock. What should we do, Falstead? Deathwing is no warrior's friend. He'll no doubt come after us once he's finished with this lesser beast, and it would take a hundred storm hammers just to dent his hide. Best we return, and let others know what we've seen. The rest of the dwarves seemed to be in agreement, but Verisa still felt like she couldn't give up just yet, despite the obvious. Faustad Ronin's a wizard. He is likely dead, yes, but if not, if he still floats down there, he could need our help. You're daft if you forgive me saying so, my elven lady. No one could have survived a fall like that. Not even a wizard. Please, just one sweep of the surface, and then we can depart. Faustad frowned, whilst his warriors looked at him as if he'd gone mental. Very well. And Faustad then turned to address his men directly. Go back without us. We should be behind you before long. But if for some reason we don't return, make certain someone knows of the Dark One's reappearance. Go. So, the rest of the dwarves buggered off, whilst Faustad had his griffin dive closer to the sea below. On their way down, however, a pair of savage roars made both Faustad and Verisa look up in concern. Sounds like the posturing's over. They're about to fight. Wonder what that orc must be thinking. Verisa didn't give a shit about the orc. All she cared about was finding Ronin. And as soon as the griffin was hovering just a few yards above the water, she began surveying the area. Surely there had to be some trace of him. He had to be somewhere nearby. He'd managed to magic himself away from danger before. Ah, there's nothing here. Just a little longer. Again, savage cries above drew their attention. The dragon battle had begun, and it was pretty obvious that the lesser dragon was way out of its depth. With every attack, Deathwing's foe was leaving itself wide open. But for some reason, the Dark One wasn't capitalising on those opportunities. For some reason, Deathwing's left forepaw remained shut and close to his chest. Why is he holding back? However, Deathwing then caught hold of his adversary, utilising his tail, wings and every limb except his front left one, and in one swift motion tore a series of bloody gashes in the Red Dragon's torso and neck. That's it. We've searched long enough. Faustad's flagging griffin pushed skyward as best he could, 
whilst Farisa curiously watched Deathwing swipe even more wounds into his foe. The lesser beast then managed to free itself from Deathwing's grasp, and to no one's surprise, the red dragon started to cheese it. But strangely enough, the gargantuan black dragon did not pursue. Instead, he peered down at his closed paw, as if looking over something. Something, or someone. Faustab, we need to follow him. Faustab stared at Verisa, as if she'd lost her goddamned mind. Deathwing refused to use his one forepaw during that entire fight. It's because he has Ronin, I'm sure of it. And clearly the wizard's as good as dead, my elven lady. What would the Dark One even want with him, other than as a snack? If that was the case, then he would have eaten him already. He clearly has some need of him. Faustad grimaced. You ask too much. This griffin's weary. We need to land soon. Just please, as far as we can go. I need to help him. I swore an oath. No oath would take you this far. But, despite his reluctance, Faustad went ahead and steered his mount after Deathwing, and Verisa said nothing more, knowing that Faustad had the right of it. For reasons unclear to her, she could not abandon Ronin to what seemed to be an obvious fate. Meanwhile, Krasis still felt pretty achy after his battle with the Endless Hunger. He'd not informed the Council of what had occurred. For now, the knowledge of Deathwing's human guise needed to be his and his alone. So the dragon wished to be King of Alterac, did he? Seemed a bit absurd, really. No, there was more to Deathwing's plan than a simple power grab. He desired only blood and chaos. He desired war. Krasis may not have been able to tell the Kirin Tor, but there were others whom he could speak to. They'd rejected him over and over again, but perhaps this time they'd actually listen. So, Krasis uttered some words and teleported directly to a cavern of ice and snow. The mage then walked through the icy chamber, spending about five paragraphs observing a whole bunch of frozen corpses and blocks of ice. Wendigos, ice trolls, an elf and two orcs, even a naga, all trespassers that had met the same grisly fate. You are nothing. If not audacious. Grace's turn to see a large camouflaged blue form transform into something akin to a man. The legs were a bit too thin, and bent in awkward ways as if the guy had rickets. Malagos, how fare you? Comfortable, when my privacy is left to me. I would not be here if I had another choice. There is always another choice. Leave. I would be alone. Grace's was determined not to be daunted by the cavern's master. Have you forgotten why you dwell so silently, Malagos? So alone? It's only been a few centuries since... I forget nothing. Least of all the days of darkness. Then you remember what he who calls himself Deathwing did to you and yours. Malagos's face twisted and his claws flexed. I remember. I remember the promise. The covenant we made. Never death to another. The world guarded forever. Until the betrayal. The betrayal. Until death we. Grace has kept one hand hidden, knowing he might have to use it at any moment for swift spellcasting. But the monstrous creature held himself in check. The day of the dragon had already passed, and none of us saw anything to fear from him. He was but one aspect of the world, his most base and chaotic reflection. His day had come and gone with the most permanence. For the future, it said. For when the world would only have humans, elves, and dwarves to watch over its life, let all the factions, all the flights, the aspects come together, recreate, reshape the foul peace, and we would have the key to protecting the world, even after the last of us had faded away. And I stood with him and convinced the rest. Gracious again reminded himself that although the one before him despised Deathwing most of all, it did not mean that Malagos was going to help, or even allow Krasis to leave this cavern alive. And so, each dragon, each aspect, imbued it with a bit of themselves, bound themselves to it, forever put themselves at its mercy, forever ensuring it to be the one thing that could have power over them, although they did not know it then. Do you remember how deceiving it looked? What a simple looking object it was. Krasis then summoned an image of the demon soul, causing Malagos to gasp and cringe. Take it away! Away! Look at it, my friend. Look at the downfall of the eldest of races. Even an illusion of the artifact put so much fear in Malagos' heart that it took him more than a minute to force his gaze upon it. Forged by the magic that was the essence of every dragon, first created to fight the demons of the Burning Legion, and used by Deathwing to betray all others when the battle was done. 
used by him against his very allies. Cease this. The demon soul is lost, and the dark one is dead. Is he? Grace has dismissed the image of the demon soul, replacing it with that of a human man. Lord Prester. This man, this mortal, would be the new king of Alterac, the heart of the Lord Run Alliance, Malagos. Do you find anything familiar about him? The icy creature peered closely at the image, horror seemingly rising in his face. This is no man. Say it, Malagos. Say who you see. Deathwing. Yes, he who has been twice thought dead. He who wielded that demon soul, and forever ended any hope of the return to the age of the dragon. He who now seeks to manipulate the younger races into doing his treacherous bidding. He will have them at war with one another. Yes, Malagos, he will have them at war, until only a few survive, at which point Deathwing will finish those. You know the world he desires, one in which there is only he and his selected followers. I allied myself with him, and for this my flight was ruined. I am all that's left. The demon soul took my children. I lived only with the knowledge that he who had betrayed all had perished, that the cursed disc had been forever expunged. As did we all, Malagos. But he lives. Yes, he lives, despite your sacrifices. Malagos then eyed Krasis closely. I lost much, too much. But you, you lost all too. A vision of Alexstrasza then flashed in Krasis' mind, but the wizard quickly shook those painful memories away. Yes, I lost much, but I hope to regain something for all of us. How? I would free Alexstrasza. At that, Malagos roared with mad laughter for a very long time. That would serve you well, provided you could achieve such an impossible goal. But what good does that do me? What do you offer me, little one? You know what aspect she is, and you know what she may do for you. The laughter ceased, and Malagos hesitated. She could not. Could she? I believe that enough of a chance exists that it would be worth your efforts. Besides, what other future do you have? Malagos' draconic features intensified, with his shape finally taking its rightful form. But with his original form returned, so too did some of Malagos' misgivings. And he then asked the one question the Krasis had been dreading. The Orcs. How is it that the Orcs can hold her? I've always wondered. You know the only way they could keep her as prisoner, my friend. So those insignificant creatures have the demon soul? Yes, they have the demon soul. I do not think they know fully what they wield, that they know enough to keep Alexstrasza at bay. But that's not the worst of it. What could be worse? Gracis knew that he'd nearly pulled Malagos close enough to sanity to agree to help, but what he said next was absolutely crucial. I believe Deathwing now knows what I do, and he will stop at nothing until the cursed disc and Alexstrasza are both his. Ronin woke up, finding himself lying in the middle of a forest again, only this time he was not greeted by the lovely face of Verisa Windrunner. This time he was alone, and this forest was dark and eerily silent. But as he lifted his head and glanced around, a voice then broke said silence. Ah, you're awake. Rodin looked towards the faceless shape lingering in the shadows, and for a moment he wondered if it was Krasis. However, as the shape drew closer and stepped into the light, he revealed himself to be someone else entirely. You are well. I'm in one piece. Thank you. The stranger then smiled. You know me then, human. You're Deathwing the Destroyer. One among many of my titles, mage. And as accurate and inaccurate as any other. I knew I chose well. You don't even seem surprised that I appear to you thus. What do you want from me? I want nothing from you, Wizard Ronin. Rather, I wish to help you in your quest. My quest? Yes, your quest. To free the Great Dragon Queen. Ronin instinctively fired off a spell at Deathwing. However, the shadowy figure simply shrugged it off. Now was that really necessary? Deathwing then moved closer to Ronin, in an ever so slightly threatening manner, before producing a little wine sack and handing it to the mage. Drink. You will find it most refreshing. Ronin went ahead and did what he was told. He was incredibly thirsty after all, but also, he didn't really have much choice but to cooperate at the moment. You know so little of us. There's not exactly a lot of documentation on your kind. Most of the researchers get eaten. At that, Deathwing laughed. Hard. 
I'd forgotten how amusing humans could be, my little friend. Yes, there's probably some truth to that. Awkward silence filled the air until Ronin repeated his previous question. What do you want? What am I to you? You are a means to an end. A way of achieving a goal long out of reach. A desperate act by a desperate creature. Ronin was confused for a second before noting the frustration in Deathwing's face. Wait, you're saying that you're desperate? What do you see, human? A figure in shadowy black. The dragon Deathwing in disguise. And the obvious answer. Do you not see more, my little friend? Do you not see the loyal legions of my kind? The many black dragons, or for that matter crimson ones, that once filled the sky, long before the coming of humans and elves? Ronin shook his head, still failing to comprehend Deathwing's point. No, you don't, because they no longer exist. The world was ours, and we kept it well. The magic was ours, and we guarded it well. Life was ours. But then others came. Lesser forms. Minute lifespans. Quick to rashness. They plunged into what we knew was too great a risk. And in their folly, they brought the demons to us. Ronin leaned forward. Every wizard on the planet studied the legends of the Demon Horde. This was interesting stuff. If not for the dragons, this world would no longer be. Even a thousand orc hordes cannot compare to what we faced. To what we sacrificed ourselves against. In that time we fought as one, drove the demons from our world, and in the process lost control of the very thing we sought to save. The age of our kind passed. The elves, then the dwarves, and finally the humans each laid their claims to the future. Our kind dwindled, and we fought among ourselves. Slew one another. Everyone knew of the animosity between the five dragon flights, but what they didn't know was why. Why do you fight? After sacrificing so much together, misguided ideas, miscommunication, so many factors that you would not understand. What's done is done, but I would make amends, for my part. I would help you free the Dragon Queen Alex Straza. Ronin bit back his first response, deciding instead to choose his next words very carefully. You and Alex Straza are enemies, for the same insipid reasons our kind have fought for so long. Mistakes were made, human but I would rectify them now. Ronin suddenly felt very compelled to make and maintain eye contact with Deathwing. There was something deep in the dragon's eyes, calling to him, pulling him in. Alex Straza and I should not be foes. Of course not. We were once the greatest of allies. That can happen again, don't you agree? I do. And you are on a quest to rescue her. A nagging feeling stirred within Ronin, making him suddenly feel very uncomfortable under Deathwing's gaze. How did... How did you find out about my quest? However, the dragon's eyes flared and pulled him right back in again. That is of no consequence. No. On your own, you will fail. There's no doubt of that. Why you continued as long as you did, I cannot fathom. But now, with my aid, you can do the impossible, my friend. You will rescue the Dragon Queen. Deathwing then stretched out a hand, holding a small silver medallion and Ronin's fingers reached out, seemingly of their own accord, to pick it up. You will rescue Alex Straza, my fine little puppet. Because with this, I'll be there to guide you the entire way. Meanwhile, how the bloody hell do you lose a dragon? It was a question that both Farisa and Falstad were now asking themselves, but neither could come up with a satisfactory answer. Deathwing had been in sight the entire trek, right up until he flew into a cloud and just outright disappeared. <sighs> it is no use, my elven lady. We have to land. Neither we nor my poor Mauk can go any further. Farisa had to agree, despite still wanting to continue the hunt. So she used her super elven seeing powers to scan the rocky landscape below for a potential landing spot. How about over there? Those rough hewn hills that look like my grandmother beard and all. Aye, that's a good choice. And so they descended, as stealthily as they possibly could, because this was Kazmadan. The orcs would no doubt have many outposts within this region. Eri be praised. As much as I enjoy the freedom of the sky, that was far too long to be sitting on anything. Go on now. Go get yourself some food and water. You deserve it, beast. I saw a stream nearby. Probably had some fish in it. He'll find it if he wants it. Falstad then slapped the griffin on its rump, and the creature buggered off. Is that wise? My dear, fish don't necessarily make a meal for one like him. It's best to let him hunt on his own for something proper. He'll be back soon enough. 
In the meantime, why don't we put together a meal for ourselves? So they did that, grabbing some water from the nearby stream and all of that sort of stuff. And sure enough, the griffin returned fairly promptly as well. And the three of them then settled down. I saw nothing from the air, but we can't assume the orcs aren't near. Should we take turns to keep watch? Is this the best thing to do? Shall I go first or... No. I'm too wound up to sleep anyway. I'll go for... Farisa chuckled to herself. You had to admire the dwarves' ability to fall asleep so bloody quickly. But now that she was practically alone, her mind began to wander. Was Ronin still alive? What did Deathwing want with him? Had the wizard made some dark alliance with the destroyer? No, she thought. He wouldn't do that. Would he? Frustrated with the sheer number of questions and very few answers, Farisa then stepped away from the dwarf and his mount, and ventured out to do a little patrol. And in true elven fashion, had a conversation with some trees. See, Kazmadan had once been a very healthy land, but when the orcs came, that changed. And whilst the dwarves could cheese it, the trees couldn't. They were stuck here, because they're trees. Courage. A new spring will come. I promise you. Cheers, love. Anyway, after her brief rapport with a bunch of trees, Farisa's mood lightened a little bit. These rocky hills no longer felt quite so foreboding. She was half tempted to just let Faustad sleep through. But if she didn't get any sleep, then she'd just be a liability to the both of them. So she made her way back to their encampment, but as she drew near, a sudden snap of a nearby twig forced her to stop and go into stealth mode. She then heard another sound from the same direction, only this time followed by a savage squawk as Faustad's griffin decided to get involved. And that, in turn, stirred Faustad awake. What is it? Something among the trees. Something your mount went after. Well, he better not eat it until we've had a chance to see what it is. So, the two of them also gave chase into the forest, and soon enough, stumbled upon the griffin and its prey. Get off me! Away! Leave it, boy. The griffin reluctantly moved out the way, allowing Verissa and Faustad to finally identify just what kind of intruder they were dealing with. A goblin. Spying, were you? Maybe we should run you through now and be done with it. No, no. This disgraceful one is no spy. No orc friend am I. I just obeyed orders. Then what are you doing out here? Hiding. Saw a dragon. Black as night. Dragons eat goblins. You saw a black dragon? When? Just before dark. In the sky or on the ground? The ground. He. You can't trust the word of a goblin, my elven lady. They don't know the meaning of truth. I will believe him if he can answer one question. Was this dragon alone, goblin? And if not, who was with him? No. Not alone. He had another with him. They were talking, but I didn't listen. Wanted to get away. Don't like dragons and don't like wizards. Wizards? Yes. Farisa couldn't help but feel slightly excited. This wizard. Describe him. So the goblin did. Wasn't much of a description, but how many other tall red-haired wizards could there be hanging about in this area? Sounds like your friend. Seems you're right after all. We need to go after him. In the dark. Look, you've not slept at all. Please, Faustad. It's not like we have to go out searching for him. We already know where he landed. Or rather, this one does. Faustad sighed and looked back towards the goblin. And how do we know we can trust him? I'm telling you, my elven lady, these creatures are notorious liars. At that, Verisa started to unsheath her sword. Because he has two options. Either he shows us where Ronan and Deathwing landed, or I cut him to pieces and we use him as bait. Okay then. Well, goblin... You heard the lady. If I were you, I'd do as she says. I will. I will, mistress. I'll take you wherever you want to go. Don't hurt me. Good. You have my word. Take us where we need to go and I will let you loose. Do you have a name, goblin? Krill. My name is Krill. And I assure you, mistress, I'll lead you exactly to where you need to go. I promise. As is tradition, Necro's skull crusher was mooching about fingering the demon soul, whilst trying to figure out his next move. The artifact possessed great power, but the maimed orc knew full well that he'd only tapped the surface of its potential. But Necros wasn't a dumbass. In understanding his ignorance of the object, he also knew it would be foolish to even try to unlock its secrets. Yes, the demon soul possessed power that could likely wipe out the entire alliance force at their borders, but if not wielded carefully, the disc could also obliterate all of Grimbatol. Torgus returns! Finally, the commander excelled in relief. How far? 
A few minutes out, if that. All right then. Necros went ahead and made his way outside to await the Dragon Rider's arrival. And sure enough, a dark form appeared in the distance. But as the dragon became more and more visible, Necros noted that it was flying a bit weird. Its wings were torn, its tail hung practically limp, and its rider sat half slumped in the saddle. And when the dragon finally arrived, it didn't so much land as just smash right into the ground and die immediately. But its rider rose from the dust, spat some blood, and walked right up to Necros. He didn't look angry though, he looked utterly defeated. We're lost. We're lost, Necros. I'll have none of that. You shame the clans. You shame yourself. Shame. I've no shame, old one. I've merely seen the truth. And the truth is we've no hope now. Not here. Despite the Orc Champion being much bigger than him, Necros grabbed Torgus and gave him a good old shake. Speak then. What makes you spout such treason? Look at me, Necros. Look at my mount. You want to know what did this? You want to know what we fought? An armada of griffins? A legion of wizards? Tell me! Death. Death itself. Death in the form of a black dragon. Deathwing. Necros fell silent. This could not be. And yet, Torgus wouldn't make up such a thing. Tell me everything. Leave out no details. And so, despite his condition, Torgus did just that. So the humans had managed the unthinkable, had they? A pact with the only creature both sides respected and feared. Balls. Get yourself patched up, Torgus, and get some sleep. I'll be needing you later. But Necros, obey! The fury in Necros' voice was enough to cause Torgus to submit, so he hobbled off to go and get some rest and stuff, whilst Necros then turned to the crowd of orcs that had gathered behind him. Gather what's important and get it into the wagons. Move the eggs and crates padded with hay. Keep them warm. Be prepared to slay any whelps still too wild to train properly. Slay the whelps? But we need... We need whatever can be moved quickly. Just in case. The orcs eyed their commander, waiting for him to finish his sentence. In case of what? In case I don't manage to take care of Deathwing. At that, everyone in the crowd looked at Necros as if he'd gone mental. You, come with me. We need to figure out how to move the mother. It was in that moment that one of the more savvy orcs in the crowd kind of pieced together what Necros was planning. You're abandoning Grimbatol, aren't you? You're taking everything north to the lines. Yes. But they'll just follow. I gave you your orders. Why are you still standing around? Am I now surrounded by whining peons instead of mighty warriors? That little snide jab seemed to work. There were a couple more murmurs from the crowd, but the orcs then straightened and got to work, leaving Necros on his own, with his mind racing. Bring the Dragon Queen out into the open. Use her as bait, he thought. It was the best plan, or the only option. Necros then, again, finger-banged the Demon Soul, realising that he now had pretty much no choice but to try and unlock its secrets. After all, this thing was the only chance he had of defeating Deathwing. But if he failed, at least the eggs will have made it north to Zuluhead. They would aid the Horde more than he ever could. Meanwhile, Ronin woke up in a forest, again, for the third time, and although Deathwing was no longer present physically, his voice almost immediately entered the wizard's mind. Good. You're awake. Ronin clutched the silver medallion dangling around his neck. Where are you? Elsewhere. But I am also with you. That thought made Ronin shudder a little bit. What the bloody hell had he signed himself up to? What happens now? The sun rises. You must be on your way. And so, Ronin picked himself up and eyed the landscape towards the east. In that direction, the woods gave way to a rocky, inhospitable area, one that would eventually lead him to Grim Batol. So he started making his way in that direction. No, not that way. What? But this is the way to Grim Batol. And into the claws of the orcs, human. Are you really that much of a fool? <sighs> then where? See. Images then started flashing before Ronin's very eyes. A sort of bird's eye view of his present surroundings. And before the wizard even had a chance to digest what he was seeing, the vision then started moving, with dizzying swiftness. Until finally, the vision arrived, at the peak of a mountain, outside a narrow cave mouth. That is the path, the only path, that will enable you to achieve our goal. That was bloody miles. You will be aided. I did not say you would have to walk the entire way. But begin, wizard. Ronin's legs then started walking, through no choice of his own. And although the effect only lasted a few seconds, it proved efficient enough to urge the wizard on. During that journey, the dragon did not speak again, 
but Ronin knew he was still lurking somewhere deep within his own mind, keeping watch. However, as the journey continued, the thought of Varisa entered Ronin's mind. Had she survived the previous dragon attack? And if so, had she had the common sense to return to Lordaeron? Ronin then paused, suddenly filled with the urge to turn around. She wouldn't have gone back, would she? She would have insisted on continuing on, and was likely following his trail. Human. Ronin then bit back a curse. Human, it is time you refreshed yourself and ate. What do you mean? You paused. You were looking for water and food, were you not? Um, yeah. You are but a short distance from such. Turn east and journey a few minutes. I will guide you. Ronin again obeyed and made his way east. The wizard was only expecting to come across a small brook, some kind of fruit, so he was ever so slightly surprised to enter a clearing and discover a small feast waiting for him. Eat. The wizard got stuck in, eating the feast with gusto, but Deathwing grew impatient pretty quickly and piped up again. Are you full? Yes. Thanks. Then move on. You know the way. Several hours later, as the last light of the day disappeared, Ronin again paused on his journey. The only mountain he could see was still several days away. I need to talk with you. Speak. You said this path would take me to the mountain, but if so, it will take far longer than I've time. I don't know how you expect me to reach the peak so quickly. As I said earlier, you are not meant to travel the entire way by foot. Then how am I supposed to travel? Patience. They should be with you soon. They? Who's they? Stay where you are. That would be best. Deathwing was now apparently bored of that conversation because he stopped talking, leaving Ronin to stand around waiting for whoever the hell they were. His initial thought was it would probably be another dragon. But then, did this dragon have terrible indigestion or something? Why would it take a dragon this long to reach him? Suddenly, Ronin found himself illuminated. Told you he was here. I knew all along. I just wanted to see if you really did. Liar. I knew and you didn't. Ronin frowned. What sort of dragon argued with itself in multiple stupid voices? However, the light shining down upon him moved, and as Ronin's eyes adapted back to the darkness, he could now see exactly what was hovering above. It was no dragon. It was a balloon. Or rather, a zeppelin. The riders of which were goblins. Your transport has arrived. Lord Preston's ascension seems almost inevitable. He has a pretty amazing gift of persuasion. He must be right, Krasis. He must be a wizard. Well, convincing the monarchs of that will require much evidence. Their mistrust of the Kirintor grows with each day, which is likely also the work of this would-be king. We've begun watching. Only problem is this Prester proves to be very elusive. He seems able to enter and leave his abode without us knowing. Grace has feigned slight surprise. How is that even possible? We don't know. And worse than that, his chateau is surrounded by some pretty nasty spell work. We almost lost Drendon to one of those surprises. At that, Grace has glanced down at his own lack of fingers. We must move with caution. I'll speak with you again soon. What are you planning, Grace? Just a search into the young noble's past. You think you'll find anything? We can only hope. And with that, Krasis dismissed the magical FaceTime thing between himself and handsome Madeira. He did feel bad about hiding the truth from his colleagues, but it was for their own good. Their intrusions into Deathwing's mortal affairs worked in Krasis's favour a little bit. Anyway, served as a nice distraction to the bloke, which gave Krasis a bit more time. And he definitely needed a bit more time because his meeting with Malagos had been about as useful as tits on a fish. Seemed pretty obvious that Malagos felt like he could just deal with Deathwing on his own and in his own time. There was no sense of urgency to the aspect of magic, just a whole lot of hubris. So screw that guy, Krasis was going to need to look elsewhere for help. But she of the dreaming was a very difficult lady to find nowadays, which only left the other one, the Lord of Time, whose servants had already rejected Krasis' request earlier in this story. But again, the Archmage had no choice, so he did a bunch of nonsense with a flower for a few paragraphs, said some words of power, and poof. He was now standing in the midst of an endless swirling desert, with ruins and wrecked ships and artifacts and all sorts of things. Now Krasis' patience was wearing very thin after the events of the past few weeks, so it didn't take him very long at all before he snapped and yelled out, I know you're here, Nostormu. I would speak with you. The moment the mage finished yelling, the wind whipped up and a bit of a sandstorm occurred, and as the sand swept away, bloody Nostormu was standing right there. Coriolstras. 
You dare disturb my rest. You dare disturb my peace. I dare because I must, O oh great lord of time. Titles will not appease my wrath. It would be best if you went. No, not until I speak to you of a danger to all dragons, to all creatures. Not all who snorted. Dragons, you say. And what concern is that to you? I see only one dragon here. And it's certainly not the mortal wizard Crasus. Not anymore. Away with you. I would return to my collection. You waste too much of my precious time already. So much to gather. So much to catalogue. Crasus now felt pretty furious. It was one thing for Malagos not to give a shit. That guy's mental. But this one, one of the greatest of the five aspects, he through whom time itself coursed, didn't seem to care at all what happened in the present or future. All Nosdormu seemed to care about was his collection of crap. Nosdormu, Deathwing lives. However, the golden brown behemoth simply snorted again. Yes. So, you knew. Question not at all worth answering. Now, if you've nothing more of which to bother me, it is time for you to depart. Wait. If you knew that the Dark One lives, then you know what he intends. How can you just ignore that? Because as with all things, even Deathwing will pass into time. Even he will eventually be part of my collection. But if you joined, you've had your say. Now leave me be. I came here for the sake of all of us. However, another sandstorm suddenly occurred, and poof. He was now back in his sanctum, alone. Balls, rejected by Malagos, and now rejected by Nosdormu, which only left Asira. It wasn't so much that she was technically his sister-in-law, and yet he'd never spoken a single word to her in his entire life that made this the least favourable option. It was more the method in which he'd have to use to reach her. She of the Dreaming obviously spent most of her time in the dreams, but Crace's side, steeled himself, and walked over to his shelf full of potions and stuff, and grabbed a black vial. Three drops of this stuff had killed the Manta, a creature ten times the size and strength of a dragon. A creature that all had believed unkillable. So it was ever so slightly important that Crace has got the measurement absolutely right with this, because he was about to drink some of it. Because as we all know, the best way to get to sleep is to drink poison. And so, he carefully poured the tiniest drop he possibly could into a flask of water, hoped for the best, and took a sip. To you, my Alexstrasza. Always to you. Meanwhile, there was definitely someone here. One of them was human. The other... I'm not so sure. How can you even tell? Look. Boot print. Everyone else in these videos is barefoot. Falstad nodded, but to be honest, his eyes certainly weren't as sharp as an elven ranger's, so he was just kind of taking her word for it. It still gets us no closer than the first spot this little green beast brought us to. It is becoming clear to me that this little shite has us on a fool's errand. I doubt he's even seen the wizard. I have. Described him, didn't I? You know I saw him, don't you? Theresa then noticed the griffin sniffing at something hidden in a bush. So she moved to investigate and came upon a small empty wine sack with a heavenly bouquet wafting from it. The smell of which caused her to close her eyes. That bad, eh? On the contrary, I've not come across such a fabulous aroma even at the table of my lord. Ah. Uh, Okay. I can't help but think this means that Ronin was here. <sighs> My elven lady, is it possible that you simply wish that to be true? Well, who else would have been in this region drinking wine fit for kings? The Dark One? After he'd sucked the marrow from the bones of your wizard? No. If Deathwing brought him this far, he had some other reason than as a meal. First I'd then glance skyward. Well, if we hope to get much farther before night, we'd best be getting on our way. At that, Farisa glanced towards Krill. We need to deal with this one first. What's to deal with? Either we take him with us or do the world a favour and leave it with one less goblin to worry about. Now I promised I'd release him. I don't think that's wise. Nevertheless, I made that promise. Farisa stared at Faustad, hard, hoping he'd have the sense not to pursue this argument. And sure enough, the Griffin Rider nodded. Aye, it is as you say. We've made a promise, and I'll not be the one to try and sway you. Not with only one lifetime to me. And so, Farisa cut the goblin's bonds. Thank you, my benevolent mistress. A few more questions before you go. Do you know the path to Grimbert Hall? Uh, excuse me? Uh, yes, mistress. There's orcs and dragons there, but I know the way. You think the wizard's there? Yes. Yes, I do. 
Now see here, mate, you do not need to come with, Faustad. I thank you for your aid thus far, but I can proceed from here alone. And leave you alone in the middle of Orc territory with this little green wanker. No, Faustad does not leave fair damsels. No matter how capable they may be, on their own. We go together. You can turn back at any moment though, Faustad. Remember that. Only if you're with me. Farisa then glanced back to Krill again. Well, can you tell me the way? I can't tell you, mistress. It's, uh, it's better if I show you. But I granted you your freedom, Krill. For which this poor wretch is so eternally grateful, mistress. But only one path to Grimbatol offers certainty. And without me, neither elf nor dwarf will find it. We've got my mount, you little rodent. We'll simply fly over. In the land of dragons? Wanna fly right into their mouths, do you? To enter Grimbatol, you'll have to follow me. Faustad again tried to protest, but Verisa couldn't see any other choice. I'm going with him, Faustad. Fine. We're going with him then. Do we need to go the entire way by foot? No. We can travel some distance with Griffin. And I know just where the beast should land. And so, off they went, with Krill providing directions. However, some time into their journey, Faustad suddenly pointed off to the east, towards a dark form that was rising in the sky. Dragon! Down there! Many places to hide, even for a griffin. The dwarf quickly guided his mount down, towards the ravine that Krill had pointed out, and then they waited, for several minutes. But, after those several minutes, the dragon had still not passed overhead. And after waiting for another several minutes, Farisa grew somewhat impatient and poked her head out to see what was what. And in the sky was nothing. Not even a speck. No sign. We're clear. Good. Unlike my cousins, I've no taste for holes in the ground. All right, Krill. Danger's done. You can peel yourself. Faustad's voice cut off and Farisa jerked her head around immediately. What is it? The damn spawn of a frog's gone. Well, how could he have just disappeared? I wish I knew, my elven lady. It's a neat trick. Can you griffin hunt him down? Why bother? We're better off without him. Because I... Suddenly, the ground beneath the two of them broke apart, and they fell into what initially felt like mud. However, it became clear quite quickly that they were sinking. This was no mud. Oh, what the f... Farisa tried to seize rock, to seize anything, but failed. Within moments, she was already waist deep, whilst Faustad was already struggling to keep his head above ground. Faustad, my hand, reach for it. Unfortunately, the gap between them was too great, and Verisa watched in horror as her companion was pulled under. My, my, dear, oh dear. Verisa looked up to see Krill's toothy grin leaning out from a small crevice. Forgive me, my mistress, but the Dark One insisted that no one interfere. He left me the task of seeing to your deaths. Menial bit of work for one as clever as myself, but my master does, after all, have very large teeth. Can't refuse him now, can I? I hope you understand. You bastard! And then the ground swallowed Farisa. Dirt filled her mouth, and then seemingly her lungs, and she passed out. Ronin stood at the bow of the airship, arms folded, staring at the two creatures piloting it. They were darting back and forth, adjusting gauges and muttering to themselves. And the wizard couldn't help but wonder how such an insane race could have possibly built this wondrous piece of technology. And even if they did build it, he wasn't entirely sure that they knew how to pilot it. But there wasn't much the wizard could do about it. So he leaned over a rail and allowed his mind to wander. And as usual, his thoughts turned to Verisa. If she lived, she was definitely on his trail. But there was no way she'd know about the Zeppelin. No, the likelihood was that she'd end up wandering Kazmadan, or even worse, head straight for Grimbatol and get herself killed. Ronin's thoughts then turned to guilt for Duncan and Moloch and all the other men that had died during his previous mission. Human. There was a glance to see one of the goblins, called Nullin, now standing behind him. What? Time to prepare to disembark. We're here. I don't see anything. The other goblin, Void, then approached. This is the place. And it's the truly Master Wizard. It's the clouds, Master Wizard. They obscure things to your human eyes. But we goblins have much sharper vision. Below us is a very soft, very safe ledge. Climb down the ladder and we'll drop you off. You'll see. Rowdy wasn't exactly convinced. He definitely wanted off this vessel, but he wasn't just going to take their word for it. However, 
As if it had a mind of its own, the wizard's left hand reached out, grasped Nullin by the throat, and squeezed. And a voice that was not his own then came out of his mouth. I said no tricks were to be played. No acts of treachery, worm. Only a game. Only a game. Game? You like games? I have a game for you to play. Ronin now found himself dragging the poor goblin towards the edge of the ship, and although he had no love for the goblin, he didn't want its blood on his hands. Deathwing, don't do this! Would you rather they led you into their little ploy, humour? The drop would not have been at all pleasant for one who cannot fly. I'm not a fool! I had no intention of climbing down the ladder. Not on a goblin's word. You wouldn't have bothered saving me in the first place if you'd thought me that adult. Are we good? You'll drop me off in a proper place, right? One of which Deathwing and I would approve? Yes, yes, no tricks, I promise. You see, no need to drop him off in the side. Ronin's possessed hand then abruptly released the goblin's throat and the creature hit the deck. Your choice, wizard. Ronin then sighed in relief and glanced towards the other goblin, Void, who stood cowering. Well, get us to the mountain. A short while later, the zeppelin now hovered above the very cave mouth that Deathwing had shown Ronin in that vision. And Ronin was very eager to descend the rope ladder and get the hell away from these goblins. So he moved towards it. However, the ladder was clattering about all over the place. Can you keep us steady? The goblins nodded, still very much scared shitless. But despite Void and Nullin trying their utmost to keep the zeppelin as steady as they could, the harsh mountain winds made the ladder extremely wobbly. And the wizard, after bashing against the side of the zeppelin and almost losing his footing several times, decided it would probably be better to risk jumping. So he took another deep breath studied the distance between himself and the ledge, threw himself towards it, and landed with a painful grunt. It didn't take long at all for the goblins in their vessel to start pulling away. They were obviously quite happy to be done with the wizard just as much as he was with them. But, without control or warning, Ronin's hand suddenly shot up, with his index finger pointing directly towards the vessel. No! However, Deathwing went ahead and ignored Ronin, and used the possessed wizard's body and magic to shoot a stream of pure fire at the fleeing zeppelin, and it exploded. You shouldn't have done that! The winds will keep the explosion from being heard, and the debris will fall to a deep valley little used. You need not fear discovery, my friend. That's not what I was- You would do yourself better to continue on into the cave. The elements outside are hardly fit for you. Ronin knew the dragon didn't care about his well-being, but it was pointless arguing, so he obeyed and made his way into the cave mouth, and as soon as he did, he immediately heard the sound of dragons and orcs. A whole lot of them. He's strong. Stronger than I imagined. The wizard was showing much more defiance than Deathwing had assumed possible. He had a strong will, that one. Which was why Deathwing was quite glad that Ronin would most likely perish in the course of matters. Strong will breeds strong wizards. Like Medivh. And the last thing Deathwing needed was another bloody Medivh. But enough of that. Deathwing, or rather Lord Prester, then made his way to Lordaeron Palace and entered into the front hall. One of the servants noted his arrival and went off to inform the king and shortly thereafter reappeared, inviting the young noble to another room to await the king's arrival. But as Deathwing entered the new room, he quickly discovered he wasn't waiting alone. Our greetings, Lord Prester. My greetings to you, sir and madam. We'd hoped to meet you sooner than this, my lord. Your reputation spread throughout the kingdoms of the Alliance. Especially in Dalaran. The reputation of the Kirin Tor is known to all as well. More and more so each day, but not in the way we wish. Deathwing noted the tone of Madeira's voice. I had expected to meet his majesty here alone. Has Dalaran some business with Lordaeron? Dalaran seeks to keep abreast of situations important to the Alliance. Something a bit more difficult of late, due to our not being notified about major summits between members. Yes, well... I did urge his majesty to allow you to join the deliberations over Alterac, but he seemed adamant about leaving you out of them. Did he now? We know the outcome regardless. Congratulations are in order for you, Lord Preston. It came as a surprise to me, I must tell you. All I ever wanted was to keep the Alliance from falling apart, after Lord Perinald's unfortunate behaviour. Yes, a terrible thing. One would have never thought it of the man. I knew him when he was younger. A bit timid, but he certainly didn't seem like the traitorous type. Your former homeland's not too distant from Ulterrec, is it not, Lord Prester? 
For the first time during this conversation, Deathwing felt a twinge of annoyance. This game no longer pleased him. But before he could answer the question, King Terranus entered the room. Followed closely by a toddler that's apparently Arthas, but I don't quite understand how that's possible considering Arthas was 9 at the start of the Second War. So I'm just going to ignore that cameo. Instead, King Terranus looked towards the two from the Kirin Tor and angrily blurted out, I already told the Major Domo that I've no time for you today. If Deloran has any claims or protests to make, they can send a formal writ through the proper channels. Now good day. Well then we'll be going, Your Majesty. But we've been empowered to tell you that the Council hopes you'll soon see reason on this matter. Dalaran has always been a steadfast, loyal ally, when it chooses to be. Both wizards ignored the King's snide comment. Lord Prester, it's been an honour to meet you face to face at last. I trust it will not be the final time. We shall see. And with that, both wizards buggered off. My most humble apologies for that scene, Prester. The very nerve of them. They barge into my palace as if Dalaran and not Lordaeron rule here. This time they go too far- However, the king froze mid-sentence as Deathwing raised a hand. He didn't really care what Terranus had to say at the moment. He was more interested in what the two mages were now discussing. So he went ahead and did some kind of eavesdropping spell or something. He's a blank. I couldn't sense a thing about him, Madeira. Perhaps you're still not fully recovered, Drendin. After all, the shock you- I'm over it. It will take more than that to kill me. What about you? Did you sense anything? No. He's powerful. Possibly as powerful as Medivh. He must be using some talisman or something. No one's that powerful. Not even Krasus. Do we really know how powerful Krasus is? He's older than the rest of us. That surely means something. Deathwing now found his curiosity well and truly piqued. What is Krasus doing anyway? Why is he keeping so secret? He says he wants to find out about Prester's past. But I think there's more. There's always more with him. Deathwing cancelled out his eavesdropping spell. He'd heard enough. He then snapped his fingers, allowing Terranus to unfreeze and finish his boring story. Far and I won't stand for it. I have a mind to cut off all diplomatic relations with them immediately. Yes, probably a wise move. But draw it out, your majesty. Allow them to lodge their protest first. Then begin closing the gates on them. You're a very patient young man, Prester. I appreciate you allowing me to vent. Now let's get down to the matter at hand, shall we? We've more than two years before the wedding can take place, but it will require extensive planning. I understand completely, your majesty. The king then explained all the various functions his future son-in-law would need to attend to over the coming months. It was important for him to be present at each and every upcoming occasion, alongside Kalia, so that the people could see them together and get used to it and stuff. However, as the king continued to babble, Deathwing's attention drifted. Crisis. Who was that then? Was that the individual that had triggered the endless hunger? How very interesting. Crisis was now in the deepest sleep he'd ever had. Or at least he hoped that's what it was. He was dreaming, which was a good sign. But he also had a sneaking suspicion that every moment that passed slid him closer and closer to oblivion. At first, the dream was murky. Images from his subconscious. However, more distinct apparitions soon started to appear. And then, nothing. Pure darkness. You would sacrifice anything for her, would you not, Coriolstras? I would give myself if that's what it takes to free her. Poor loyal thing. A shape then started to form in the darkness. A shape that seemed very much like Alexstrasza to the Archmage. But as he tried to reach for it, it vanished. You slip quicker and quicker toward the final rest, brave one. Is there something you would ask of me before that happens? Only that you help her. Oh, nothing for yourself. Not your fading life. All I ask is for her. Suddenly, Crisis felt himself being dragged upward, out of the darkness and into a place of colour and light. I will not demand such a sacrifice from you, Kariel Strauss. Thank you, Asira. Ever polite, ever diplomatic. Even to my consorts who have in my name rejected your desires more than once. They did not understand the situation fully. You mean I? did not understand the situation fully. It is not so simple a matter to free your beloved Alex Strauss, and even I cannot say if the cost is worth it. Is it not better to let the world run its course? If the giver of life is to be freed, will it not happen of its own accord? Once again, Grace's was furious. Every single one of the dragon aspects he'd visited had shown nothing but apathy. 
Is Deathwing truly to be the culmination of the world's course, then? Because that is what's going to happen if you just sit back and dream. Do not mention that one. Why? What's the matter, Lady of Dreams? Does he give you nightmares? He is one whose dreams I will never enter. Never again. He is one who is possibly more terrible in his sleep than even waking. Graces didn't even pretend to understand what the hell she was talking about. I know that you and yours still circulate among the younger races, Asira. I know that you still influence the dreams of humans. And elves. To a point, Coriolstras. There are limits to even my domain. But you've not given up entirely on the world then, have you? Malagos and Nosdormu hide in madness and the relics of times past. But you? Dreams are of the future, are they not? If Deathwing gets what he wants, there will be no more dreams. No more hopes. With or without your help, Isira, I will go on. I must. You are certainly welcome to do so. Grace has then turned away from Asira and send me back. However, he then felt a gentle touch on his shoulder. And as the Archmage turned back, he saw Asira now appeared in a different form. Do not go yet, Coriolstras. And why not? I will consider what you've said. And if you find you agree with me, then I will endeavour to convince Malagos and Nosdormu. Although from them I can promise nothing. I... Thank you. I've done nothing for you yet, except kept your dreams alive. Sleep well, poor Coriolstras, for in the battle you seek to fight you will need all your strength and more. And do not undervalue those you think only pawns. Meanwhile, Ronin made his way through multiple tunnels. This fortress was immense, and its layout made absolutely no sense whatsoever. It didn't help that Deathwing had not spoken to him once since he'd entered the cave mouth. He didn't trust the Black Dragon, but surely the Dark One would have given him some guidance or direction. Something must have drawn his attention away. Ronin then sat down to have a bit of a rest, but in an effort to relax and clear his mind, a whole bunch of doubts came flooding in. Did he really think he could free the Dragon Queen on his own, or had he come here simply to die? Was he insane for even coming up with this plan in the first place? Did he even come up with this plan in the first place? He then thought back to when Krasis had first approached him. The Council Mage had brought up the topic of dragons, and from there told the story of Alexstrasza, how she was held captive, how the Horde would always remain a threat as long as they had her. It had been in that moment that Ronin had come up with the idea of freeing her, but it was Krasis that truly encouraged the idea and urged him to see it through, which almost completely contradicts the conversation the two of them had in the first chapter, but whatevs. Suddenly, a noise stirred Ronin awake, Somewhere in the course of all of that exposition, he must have drifted off. The wizard quickly got to his feet and pressed himself against a wall. However, the noise, a barely discernible muttered conversation, then faded away. And Ronin then realised that that conversation had not actually come from a nearby corridor. It was this fortress's weird acoustics. The orcs he'd heard were likely several levels below him. But that gave him an idea. Perhaps he could follow those sounds. Perhaps that would be a good way to finally make some progress and find the bloody Dragon Queen. So he went ahead and did that, and it actually worked. He was now definitely heading the right way. He knew this because, as he made his way through the tunnels, he could hear more and more sounds, as if Grimbatol itself had just awakened. He could hear the hustle and bustle of orcs, and the hustle and bustle of dragons. The wizard was now brimming with confidence, so he started to move at a much faster pace, which he then regretted immediately as he entered a room containing two huge orcs. However, both orcs seemed more stunned to see a human wizard here than he did to see them, and that slight hesitation allowed Ronin to cast a spell. Human scum. The other orc reached for an axe and lumbered forward. He was wearing a necklace of fingers, some human, some elven. It was gross, but it gave Ronin a weird idea. He raised his hand and let off another spell, which gave the orc pause, but after a few seconds of awkward silence and seemingly nothing happening, the orc laughed. <laughs> I'll make it quick for you, wizard. However, a scratching sensation forced the orc to then look down at his own chest, and he cried out in horror as he realised the fingers on his necklace had climbed up his torso and were now digging into his throat with a mind of their own. And as the orc could now not breathe, and was also kind of terrified by what was happening, he just kind of keeled over and died. So that was over pretty quickly. Ronin then carried on, making his way through more tunnels, this time not allowing himself to get overly confident bloopity blah 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 until eventually he came across two more orcs. But this time, they didn't notice him. The two of them appeared to be carrying something. And as the wizard squinted and moved a little bit closer, he could see what it was. An egg. A dragon egg, to be precise. 
Where the bloody hell were they taking that? Ronan then looked away and ducked around a corner. However, a voice then rang out in his head and startled him. Human, where are you? I'm right where you left me. Still looking for the Dragon Queen's chamber. You found something else though, didn't you? I saw a glimpse of it. What was it? Uh, nothing. Just a couple of orcs in battle practice. I wish to see it. Show me. It's nothing. Before Ronin could finish his lie, his body suddenly rebelled against him. Moving back to the spot Ronin had been previously, with his right hand grasping the silver medallion and holding it up. Ronin tried to speak out, to inform the dragon that he was kind of vulnerable, being out in plain sight like this, but his mouth wouldn't work. It was unlikely that Deathwing would have even cared anyway. He had no choice but to just stand here and allow the dragon to survey. I see. You may return to the tunnel now. Ronin then regained control of his own body and sighed in relief, and then slipped out of sight. You follow the wrong path. Go back to the previous intersection. The fact that Deathwing was making no comment on Ronin's attempt at subterfuge worried the wizard quite a bit. There was no doubt Deathwing had seen the egg, so why wasn't he saying anything about it? But Ronin wasn't going to press his luck. This way? Yes. Take the second tunnel on your left next. Deathwing then provided flawless directions for the next few hours until eventually... Wait. So Ronin did, and after a few moments, some voices came from down the tunnel. You, where have you been? Most oh, sorry, O oh Grand Commander. It couldn't be helped. There was no mistaking that the second voice belonged to a goblin. So that was how Deathwing seemed to know so much about this place. He had spies here. Move on. Two corridors ahead. Turn right. Follow until you see the opening. All right. Time to move again, it seemed. Ronin went ahead and obeyed those new instructions until again, eventually... Halt! The urgent tone of the dragon's voice made Ronin flatten himself against a wall, but the passage remained empty. What was all that about? Your destination lies before you, but the way may be guarded by more than flesh. By magic, you mean? Centuries of magical origin. Hold out the medallion before you and move toward the entrance. What about orcs? I still have to worry about them. All will be known, human. Again, Ronin did as he was told. Held the medallion out and slowly edged forward. Hmm. Only minor spells. I'll deal with them. The crystal in the medallion then flared for a second or two. There. The spells have been eradicated. So, I should go in? I would be disappointed if you didn't. Ronin sighed. There was no need to be a dick about it. The wizard then stepped through the entranceway, and finally, in the center of the room, was Alexstrasza, staring at him. Step back! However, a flash of light surrounded the wizard, and every fiber of his being shook from some monstrous force. And as he collapsed and felt his consciousness slip away, he heard Deathwing say one single word whilst laughing maniacally. Perfect. Burr! With breathing once more becoming an option for her, Verisa sat bolt upright. But as she opened her eyes, she saw that she was now in a cave, with three figures stood nearby. She couldn't quite make out who they were, due to her eyes not quite adapting to the darkness just yet. But she could see by the shape of their forms that she was probably better off keeping as quiet as she possibly could. But it was a bit too late for that because she'd just gone Buh! really loudly. Supper's away. Looks more like dessert to me. Definitely dessert. Slim pickings lately. But time now for a feast, yes? Something to Verisa's right, then let out a groan. Twas Felstad. He still lived too. Although judging by his wounds, the ranger was not confident he'd last much longer. Patience, dwarf. You'll be first, don't you worry. Why can't we just do it now, Gree? Because I said so, Schnell. I'm leader. Yes, Schnell. Yeah, Gree. Yeah. Yes, Vosh. The other creature bobbed his head up and down frantically. Yeah, Gree. Your leader, yeah. The trio then went back to some muffled conversation around the fire, and Verisa again looked to Falstad who stared back at her. But as she raised an eyebrow towards him, he answered with a shake of his head. Despite his strength, he could not escape his bonds. So the ranger went ahead and tried to find some looseness in her own ropes. Nope, these cannibal creatures might be barbaric, but they sure knew how to tie a knot. Heh, <laughs> is it lively? Should make for good sport. Where's the others? Should have been here by now. Hog knows what'll happen if he doesn't obey. Maybe he... The leader stopped mid-sentence and suddenly seized his throwing axe, and then 
All chaos broke loose. <laughs> well, no wonder the trolls fought so hard. Gimel, you see this? Hi, Ron. Much better sight than what I found over here. Let's see if we can get these ropes off you without too much damage to that fine phone. As Rom started to fiddle about with Varisa's bonds, she got a good look at his face. As suspected, twas a dwarf. At least six inches shorter than Faustad, but much stockier in build. Here you go. The ropes fell away, and Varisa slowly picked herself up off the ground. But as she did, she heard a long string of swear words to her right. Shut your mouth, or I'll stuff that gag back in permanent. It'd take a whole army of your hill dwarfs to take one from the early down. There was a murmur from the rest of the crowd of rescuers, indicating that if Faustad didn't shut up, both he and Farisa could potentially find themselves tied up again. Faustad, be polite. They did just save us from a pretty awful fate. Aye, you have the right of it. Those damn trolls, they'll eat anything, dead or alive. They mentioned some companions. Perhaps we should leave this place quickly. No need to worry about them. How do you think we found this trio? However, Rom then mused for a moment. Well, you may be right, nonetheless. They're not the only band of trolls in this region. The orcs, they use them almost like hunting hounds. Thank you for your timeliness. Had I known it were you we were rescuing, I'd have made this sorry bunch move faster. The other dwarf, Gimel, then piped up. George is dead. Nan's bad needs fixing up. The rest of the wounded can travel well enough. Then let's be moving. That means you too, butterfly. That little jab was directed towards Faustad, who looked deeply insulted, and Varisa was pretty sure Butterfly was some kind of slur used towards airy dwarfs, so she quickly placed a hand on his shoulder to keep him somewhat calm. The group of rescuer dwarfs then moved around the cave, looting the trolls for any useful items. However, they also looted their own dead companion, and seemed quite intent to leave his body where it lay, rather than bringing it with them. The war demands some proprietaries to be left behind, Lady Elf. George would have understood. We'll divide his stuff up to his nearest kin, and they'll also get an extra share of the troll's items. I had no idea there were any of you left in Kazmadan. It was said that all the dwarves left when it became clear they could not hold the land against the Horde. Aye, all that could leave did. Wasn't possible for us though, you know. The Horde, it came like the proverbial plague. Cut many of us off from any route. We were forced to go deeper underground than we've ever gone. Many died then, and many more's died since. How many are you? My clan? Seven and forty. We once counted hundreds. We spoke to three other clans, two larger than ourselves. Put the total number at three hundred, give or take. Three hundred's still quite a number. With that many I'd have gone to take Grimbatol back. Well, perhaps if we fluttered and pranced about in the sky like dizzy bugs. But on the ground or under it, we're still at a disadvantage. Only takes one dragon to bake the earth. Again. Old enmities between the area and the hills threatened to explode, so Varisa tried to mediate. Enough of this. The orcs and theirs are the enemy here, are they not? If you fight with one another, does that not serve their purpose for them? Faustad then mumbled an apology to Varisa, as did Rom, but Mama Varisa wasn't satisfied. Not good enough. Turn and face each other. Swear you'll fight only for the good of all of us. Swear you'll always remember that it is the orcs that slew your brothers. Aye, tis the right of it. I'll shake. Well, if you be doing it, then I be doing it. The two then clasped hands, and then the party left the cave and moved on. Now that the danger of the trolls is behind this lady elf, you should tell us what brings the two of ye to our wounded land. Is it as we hope? As the war turned back on the orcs, will Kazmadan soon be free again? The war has turned against the Horde, that much is true. The bulk of them were broken a few months back, and Doomhammer has disappeared. Then why are the orcs still in command of Grimbatol? You need to ask. First of all, the orcs still hold out in the north at Don Gaz. It is said they're beginning to cave in, but they want to go down without a fight. And second, have you not noticed they have dragons? <laughs> Rom shot his second in command a quick death stare for the snort, but then nodded at Faustad in resignation. Aye, dragons. The one for we earthbound can I battle. Got a young one on the ground once, made short work of it. Still lost one or two good warriors though, but for the most part, they stay up there and we're forced to hide down here. You fought the trolls though, and surely the orcs as well. Aye, we've done them some damage, but it means nothing whilst our home's still under orc axe. Now, I ask again, 
Tell me who you are and what you're doing here. If Gazmadan's still orcish, then you fools must be suicidal. My name is Varisa Windrunner, Ranger, and this is Falstad of the Ares. We're here because I search for a human, a wizard. Tall, young, red hair. When I last saw him, he was headed this direction. Varisa chose not to mention Deathwing's presence for the moment, and was grateful that Falstad didn't add the information himself. While as daft as wizards are, especially human ones, what would he be thinking coming here? Rum studied the two with growing suspicion. This all seemed a bit too far-fetched for him. I don't know, but I think it has something to do with the dragons. The dragons? What's he planned to do? Rescue the Dragon Queen from bondage? I'm sure she'll be so grateful she leaped him quickly. The rest of the hill dwarves all found this terribly amusing, but the ranger elf did not. And to his credit, Faustad didn't join in with the merriment either. But then he knew about Deathwing. Plus he'd made it pretty clear he felt like Ronin had likely already been eaten quite a while ago. I swore an oath, and because of it I will go on. I must reach Grimbatol and see if I can help him. The laughter then immediately ceased. Lady Verisa, I respect your calling, but have you gone absolutely mental? You and your people saved us wrong, and for that I thank you all. All I ask is that you show me the nearest tunnel to the mountain fortress and I will take it alone from there. Not alone, my elven lady. I've come too far to turn back now, and I've a mind to find a certain goblin and skin his hide for boots. So you're both mental then. Ah, <sighs> look, if it's a way to grim but all you want, then I'll not set that task to another. I'll take you there myself. I'll go with you, Rom. You cannot go alone. The rest of the band of hill dwarves all simultaneously decided that they too needed to go with Rom. But the wounded need to be taken back. But you're all stubborn assholes, so best thing to do is roll the bones. I numbers come with, low numbers go home. Farisa didn't particularly want to stand around and wait for the dwarves to play a little dice game, but there was no other choice. So she and Faustad stood there and watched as the various non-wounded dwarves pulled out their little pouches and started rolling dice around. And Faustad had a bit of a chuckle to himself. The Ares and the Hills might have their differences, but you'll find few dwarves of any kind that don't carry the dice. After quite a while of dice bullshit, here's your volunteers, Lady Verisa. Each of them are strong and ready to fight. We'll lead you to a cave at the base of the mountain, then you're on your own after that. Thank you, but... Do you mean to say there's a path that leads directly into the mountain itself? Aye, but it's no easy one. The orcs do not patrol it alone. What do you mean by that? What? You've not noticed they've dragons? Meanwhile, back with Krasis. He was back in his sanctum, mulling over his confrontation with She of the Dreaming. Isira had provided some hope, but he couldn't put all of his eggs in that basket. But first, he needed to drink from a special pool within his sanctum that had rejuvenation powers, because drinking that poison a few chapters ago had left him quite drained. However, as he leaned over the pool, a rippling in the surface caught his eye. A reflection. But it wasn't his. It was that of his pawn, Ronin. And he looked kinda dead. Now this pool had never shown this ability before, so it was a bit odd that it was doing it now. Krasis then recalled Isira's parting words. Do not undervalue those who think only pawns. What did she mean by that? Ronin didn't have any value anymore. He'd served his purpose. He'd arrived at Kazmadan, which would have no doubt stirred up the commanders there and made them think an invasion was on its way. That would no doubt cause them to retreat north, thereby temporarily losing their ability to raise more dragons, which would be great for the Alliance, but also bringing the Dragon Queen out into the open, which would be great for Krasis. Yes, Ronin had played his part well, but that didn't stop Krasis from feeling like a little bit of a dick now. What would Alexstrasza think? She cared about the younger races more so than any dragon. They were the children of the future, she'd once said. It had to be done. Krasis then bowed his respects towards the reflection of Ronin, turned, and then concentrated really hard. It was time to contact another of his agents, one of his more useful ones. He pictured the one he sought in his mind, and then reached out and opened a link. Hear me now. Hear my voice. The day may be on us at last, my patient friend. The day of freedom and redemption. For you and your people, Rom. Lift him up. His hand. That one. Still dazed, Ronin could feel someone take a hold of his hand and then grasp his little finger. <laughs> Human, you've one chance for life. Where's the rest of your party? I don't. <sighs> I'm alone. You take me for a fool. How many fingers left, hmm? Ronin tried to think as quickly as the pain would allow him. He told his captor the truth, but that had not satisfied them. So what did they want to hear? 
Please. The others. I'm not certain where they are. Don't think so. You came for her, didn't you? I know it. My spies heard. You heard, didn't you, Krill? Oh yes, Master Necros. I heard it all. Ronin's vision and concentration was still a bit hazy, but he could tell that other voice belonged to a goblin. I say it again, human. You came for the dragon. Isn't that so? I got sep- Another finger will be next. You came to free the dragon before your armies reached Grimbatol. You figured the chaos would work for you, didn't you? Once again, Ronin figured the best option was to tell this orc what he wanted to hear. Yes, we did. Necros then leaned back in triumph. Bloody brilliant at interrogation he was. But as he leaned back, Ronin got his first glance at the orc's maimed leg. You see, great Necros, Grimbatol is no longer safe, my glorious commander. Who knows how many more enemies still lurk in its tunnels? Who knows how long before the Alliance marches upon you, with the Dark One leading the way? We can't possibly defend this mountain with so few. Best if the enemy did not find us here at all, rather than waste such precious. Tell me something I don't know, little wretch. Necros then turned his attention back to the wizard. You and your comrades came too late, human. I thought ahead of all of you. You can have Grimbatol, for all the good it's worth. May the whole thing fall down on you. Necros, you must stop this insanity. That new voice caught everyone by surprise, including Ronin. He'd only heard it once before. You've no permission to speak, Reptile. The orc then reached into his pocket and clutched something, whilst the wizard observed curiously. Ronin could feel his own skin tingle as a magical force of astonishing proportions awoke. And the Dragon Queen herself then cried out in immense pain. But despite the pain, Alexstrasza persisted. You waste both energy and time, Necros. You fight for what is already lost. Alexstrasza then groaned and closed her eyes, and her breathing grew shallow. Only Zulu Head commands me, Lizard, and he's far from here. And then he turned back to Ronin. It's dragons you will want. It's dragons you'll get. You and the Dark One. And again, Necros patted his pocket. We're ready for him. At this point, Ronin really wanted to know what the hell was in that pocket. What power could it possibly have that made Necros believe it would work against the armoured behemoth? Take him away. What? Kill him? No. I'll have more questions for him later. Just, you know where to put him. Necros then buggered off revealing the goblin that had been standing behind him. And as Ronin stared at him, the goblin winked, as if both of them shared a secret. The little green bastard then slid his hand back, just long enough for Ronin to see he was carrying something. And that something was Deathwing's medallion. Meanwhile, are we almost near? Sin. That is sin. Unfortunately, Rom had been saying that for quite a while at this point. A bit more detail would have been nice. But, sure enough, after a bit more walking and talking. There it is. Farisa squinted, but even with her exceptional elven vision, she couldn't see any sort of opening at all. It's, uh, awfully small. Be a tight fit. Aye, too tight for orcs. And they think too tight for us. But there's a trick to it. A trick, you say? Ron then explained his little trick. The hill dwarves had placed a bunch of rocks, and the trick was to move them, apparently. That's... Not exactly the most elaborate trick. Aye, but with the dragons, the orcs fear little from us. Well, I suppose we'd better get started. Lady Verisa, you must wait till dark. Any sooner and you'll be sighted. We can't wait that long. It is an hour, Lady Verisa. Surely that's worth your life. The ranger turned to Faustad with a confused look on her face. You're out for a long time, my oven lady. That news panicked the ranger somewhat, but... There was little point getting worked up about it now. So she sighed and agreed to wait until nightfall before continuing. A short while later, the dwarves had set up a little camp and handed out food and stuff. And after finishing his portion, Rom wandered off. He claimed he wished to inspect some of the nearby tunnels for troll activity. But Verisa couldn't help shake the feeling that there was something else on his mind. Something he wasn't saying. So she went ahead and followed him. And soon enough, she stealthily approached the bugger who seemed to be having a secret conversation with nobody in particular. Couldn't be helped, great one. Didn't think you wanted them to know about you. There was a brief pause before Rom continued. Aye, an elf ranger, fair of face and form, that's her. 
Another pause. A wild one. From the airy. Said his mount escaped when the trolls took him. Farisa could neither see nor hear anyone else speaking. Was Rom talking to himself? She tried to edge a bit closer, but as she did... What? Where? And out of nowhere, the dwarf then turned and looked directly at her. Balls. Here I was thinking I'd gone far enough away to avoid them sharp elven ears. Why'd you have to come here, Lady Verissa? My intent was innocent, Rom. Your intent, however, leaves many questions. This business is none of your concern, eh? A medallion in Rom's hand then fled, startling them both, and Rom's head then tilted to one side, as if again listening to some unheard speaker. Are you sure? Aye, if you say so. Farisa tensed. Who are you speaking to? But Rom just held out his medallion and motioned for her to take it. So she reluctantly did. My greetings to you, Farisa Windrunner. Farisa very nearly soiled herself. The voice echoed inside her skull. What witchcraft was this? But the dwarf simply nodded his head at her, encouraging her to say something back to the disembodied voice. So she cleared her mind and thought the words, Who are you? However, nothing happened. No response. What are you doing? I replied to him. In my mind. No, Lady Verissa. You have to speak out loud. Oh, um... Who... Who are you? You know me through my missives to your superiors. I'm Krasis, of the Kirin Tor. I know your name. You're also Ronin's patron. There was a slight uneasy pause. I am responsible for his journey, yes. You know that he may be prisoner of the Orcs? I do. It was not intended. Not intended? His mission was to observe. Nothing more. The elf had stopped believing that bullshit a long time ago. Observe from where? The dungeons of Grimbatol? Or was he to meet with these hill dwarfs for some reason you have not stated? Again, an uneasy pause. The situation is far more complex than that, young one, and growing more so by the moment. Your presence, for instance, was not part of the plan. You should have turned around at the seaport. I swore an oath. I felt that it extended beyond the shores of Lordaeron. Ronan is... fortunate. If he still lives. For a third time, Crisis hesitated. The hell was his problem? Yes. It is up to us to see what can be done to free him. That took Verissa by surprise. She had not expected that. Hear me out, Verissa Windrunner. I've made some lapses in judgement. The fate of Ronin is one of those lapses. You intend to try and find him, do you not? I do. Even in the mountain fortress of the Orcs? And the dragons? Yes. Then Ronin is fortunate to have you as a friend. And I hope to be as fortunate now. I will do what I can to aid you in this formidable quest. The physical danger will be yours, though, of course. Of course. Please return the talisman to Rom for the moment. I would speak with him. So, Verissa handed the medallion back to the dwarf, who took it and proceeded to nod at whatever Krasis was saying. Seemed quite clear that Rom wasn't entirely overjoyed by whatever Krasis was saying, though. If you really think it's necessary. And Rom handed the medallion back to Verissa again. He wants you to have this for your journey. I don't want. Do you wish to find Ronin? To save him? Yes, but I am your only hope. The elf would have argued, but she had to admit it was only her and Faustad entering those tunnels. A bit of extra aid could come in handy. What do we do? Place the talisman around your neck, then return with Rom to the others. I'll guide you and your dwarven companion into the mountain, and to the most likely place where you might find Ronin. So, both she and Rom went ahead and followed those orders, and returned to camp. But before entering it, Krasis provided Verissa a few more instructions. Make no mention of what this medallion does. Don't speak around others unless I give permission. Only Rom and Gimmel presently know my role. And what is your role exactly? Trying to preserve the future for all of us. Verissa, I may ask you to do things that seem not in your best interest, but trust that they are. There are dangers ahead that you do not understand. Dangers that you alone cannot face. Now, I must attend to a matter of import. Do not depart until I give you the word. Farewell. At some point, whilst being dragged off to a cell or something, Ronin had again fallen unconscious. But as said consciousness returned to him, and he slowly opened his eyes, he immediately saw something absolutely terrifying. A fiery skull, smiling malevolently at him. But after the initial shock and horror, Ronin calmed down a bit and studied the strange being. Some kind of demonic sentinel. 
surrounded by flame but giving off no heat whatsoever. What are you? However, the macabre figure remained motionless and said nothing back. Can you hear me? Still no reply. Bloody rude, this thing was. Ronin then leaned closer, or as close as his chains would allow him. He was more curious than scared now. Was this a living thing, or just a statue? And upon further inspection, the wizard realised that although it appeared demonic in form, it was no demon. A golem, perhaps? He'd studied golems a little bit, but he'd never seen one. And he couldn't, for the life of him, recall what they were capable of. Eh, there's only one way to find out. So, ignoring the pain, Ronin started to move his remaining fingers to conjure a spell. However, the golem then burst into motion with astonishing swiftness, seized Ronin's maimed hand, and squeezed. All the wizard could do was scream. Felt like he was burning from the inside out. It was so bad that Ronin genuinely started to pray for death. But the flame surrounding the golem then started to dwindle. The creature released him and went back to being completely still and indifferent. Damn you. <laughs> naughty, naughty. Play with fire, you get burnt. Ronin tipped his head to the side to see the little goblin wanker from before. And again, that goblin carried the Dark One's medallion. So you serve Deathwing. A frown momentarily appeared on the goblin's face. His bidding I've done for a very long time. So why are you here now? I've served your master's purpose, haven't I? Played his fool well. No greater fool could there have been. But you didn't just play a fool for the Dark Lord, friend. Played one for me too. And how did I do that? In what way could I have possibly served you, goblin? Dark Lord thinks Goblin so low as to serve any master without reason of his own. I've served enough, I have. Goblin's had a reputation for being insane, but... You plan to betray even the drag? How? Poor, poor Master Necros. He's in a state. Dragons to move. Eggs to move. Orcs to move. Little time to think if that's actually what others want him to do. Might have fought more. But now that the Alliance invades from the West, can't be bothered. Has to act. Has to be an orc, you know? They're not making any sense. What a fool. The goblin then laughed maniacally and held up the medallion. You brought me this. Krill then started to fondle the medallion, peeling away at the stone in the centre. And within a few moments, a black gem popped out. And with this, no more Deathwing. You hope to use that stone to bring him down. Or make him serve me. No more toadying for the reptile. No more being his lackey. I plan long and hard for this. Waiting and waiting and watching. For when he'll be most vulnerable. This plan still seemed mental. But that didn't stop Ronin from being absolutely fascinated by it. Necros will provide the weight. Not that he knows. And this stone is part of the Dark Lord, human. A scale. Turned to stone by his own magic. Do you know what it means to hold a part of a dragon? Ronin thought back to his own studies. What was it he'd once heard? To bear some bit of the greatest of the Leviathans is to have a hold on their power. But that's never been done. You need tremendous magic yourself to make it work. And you're just a... Suddenly, the golem remembered it was still there or something and started to stir. Possibly due to Ronin's growing irritation. And Ronin went extremely still and silent himself hoping desperately that there wouldn't be a repeat of the whole burning from the inside out thing again. Well, it looks like you're busy, human. Sorry to overstay. Just wanted to tell someone of my glory. And you'll be dead soon enough. So I'll be off. Necros needs my guidance, after all. The goblin then buggered off, leaving Ronin alone with the golem. <laughs> Meanwhile... The moment night had fallen, the hill dwarves had begun to methodically remove their rocks that blocked the secret entrance. Farisa had done exactly as she'd been told, and kept her conversation with Krasis to herself, but all she could do now was wait, and try not to get too stressed out about how much time was being wasted. But soon enough, the last of the stones were removed, and Krasis' voice, sounding oddly haggard this time, echoed in her head once more. The way out. Is it open, Farisa Windrunner? Just finished. Then you may proceed. Once you're in, remove the talisman from wherever it is you've hidden it. That will allow me to observe what lies ahead. I will not speak again until you and the airy dwarf have made it through the tunnels. Verisa then turned to see Faustad standing right next to her. Are you ready, my elven lady? 
Seems to me this sorry bunch want rid of us quick. Definitely seemed that way. Rom was literally standing by the opening impatiently gesturing for them to get on with it. So, Farisa and Falstad squeezed their way through, and the moment they did, the dwarves started restacking the stones behind them. For the second time in recent memory, Farisa felt like she was being buried alive. So what do we do now? Farisa took some breaths, and then pulled the medallion out. What's that? Help. I hope. That's good, thanks. I can see quite well. What's up with you? And it was in that moment that Verisa decided, yes, Krasis had told her not to tell anyone, but this was ridiculous. Thastad, you know the Kirin Tor sent Ronin on a mission? Eh? Not the foolish one he mentioned either. So? This medallion is from the wizard who chose him. The one who sent him on his true quest. To enter the mountain. For what reason? That's not been made completely clear to me so far. But this medallion enables that wizard, Krasis, to speak with me. I can't hear anything. That's how it works, unfortunately. Ah, typical wizardry. We'd best move on. Time is, as they say, of the essence. Again, Grace's voice caused Verisa to flinch somewhat. Is he speaking to you now? He wants us to move on. Says he can guide us. He can see? Through the crystal, yes. Faustad then thrust an angry finger at the medallion itself. I swear by the airy. Play us false and that ghost will hunt you down, spellcaster. Tell the dwarf our goals are similar. Farisa relayed that message to Faustad, who grudgingly accepted it. Even the ranger had her reservations. There's a difference between goals being similar and goals being one and the same. But after all of that, Crisis began providing directions. Directions that seemed peculiar at first, but soon enough. An old dwarf and mine. The orcs think it leads nowhere. Why have Rom and his people not used it, if it leads inside? Because they've been patiently waiting. Waiting for what? Quiet. Something's coming. Both the elf and the dwarf quickly hid, and it was lucky they did because a fearsome shape then came into view. A dragon. Stay silent. The dragon's ears are very sharp. Another figure then came into view. An orc. The beast's handler. That orc then yelled something, causing the dragon to hiss and start to move on. But, just as it seemed like both the orc and dragon were about to leave, the medallion round Verisa's neck flared so bright it lit up the entire cavern. Verisa tried to cover it, but twas no use. Both the dragon and the orc reacted, and were now approaching rapidly. Remove the medallion from round your neck. Be prepared to throw it in the direction of the dragon. Verisa started to do as she was told, and Krasis then provided even more strange instructions. Tell the dwarf to step out. Reveal himself. Um, Faustad, he wants you to step out. Does he want me to get inside the dragon's mouth, or just lay down in front of it and let the beast nibble on me at its leisure? We don't have time for this. Again, Verisa repeated the wizard's words, and Faustad sighed, cursed to himself, and stepped out. Dwarf. Good. We're getting bored. You'll make good sport before you're fed to Zara's here. He's hungry. Tis he'll make good sport, Fuckfeath. Both the orc and dragon accelerated their advance. Throw the talisman now. Be certain it lands near the dragon's mouth. The command from Krasis seemed pretty absurd, making Verisa wonder if she'd actually heard it correctly. Ranger, throw it now! So, with expert aim, Verisa threw the medallion towards the mouth of the dragon. However, the dragon itself went ahead and caught the damn thing with its mouth. Balls. Surely Krasis had not expected that. But then something weird happened. Something that caused the elf, dwarf, and orc to all pause in confusion. Instead of either swallowing or spitting out the medallion, the dragon stopped still, tilted its head, and then sat down. The orc handler attempted to shout a command, but the dragon just ignored him. Looks like your hounds found a toy to play with. Guess you'll have to fight your own battles for once. The dwarf and orc then ran at each other and started their little battle, which Verisa quickly joined. The orc was strong, with a reach that far exceeded his foes, even managed to catch Falstad's beard and singe it with a torch at one point, but it was two against one, so he died. Are you alright? Saddened at the loss of so many good years' beard growth, but I'll get over it. Faustad then turned his gaze back towards the dragon. The beast had now dropped down on all fours completely, and the elf and dwarf watched in amazement as the dragon spat the medallion out from its mouth and then looked at them expectantly. Does it want us to do what I think it wants us to do, my elven lady? I'm afraid so. Verisa approached the dragon and gingerly picked up the medallion. The way is clear now. Best you hurry before others come. What did you do to this monster? I spoke with him. He understands now. Understands what, Farisa thought, but she didn't say it. 
Instead, she turned to her companion and informed him that they were to move on, and then they did. A short while later, the pair had made their way through the abandoned mine and climbed a precarious passage, which brought them out onto a upper level of a massive cavern, and below them were a whole bunch of scurrying orcs. Looks as though they're all planning to leave. It worked. There was a tone to Krasis' voice that suggested those words were meant only for himself. Down there, look. Farisa followed Falstad's gaze. Tis Krill, I'm sure of it. Looks like he knows his way around here well. Krasis, can you show us how to get down to where that goblin's heading? However, nothing but silence. No echoey voice in her head whatsoever. What's he saying? Nothing. He's not responding. So we're on our own then. For now, it seems. That ledge over there should take us where we need to go. Necro shoved a peon with an angry grunt. Things were not going fast enough, as far as he was concerned. The lower cast orcs were moving around at a snail's pace, and his scouts kept coming back insisting there was absolutely no trace of an advancing alliance force whatsoever. Bloody useless morons, the lot of them. He knew the truth. <clears throat> Necros turned to see his chief handler awkwardly standing right next to him. Speak, Progus. Why are you skulking around? The male, Necros. I think he dies soon. Again, Necros grunted in frustration. Things were going from bad to worse. Show me. So the two of them then moved as fast as Necros could hop to a nearby cavern, which housed the eldest and possibly only surviving consort of Alexstrasza, as far as they were concerned. Tyrannostras! Despite the beast still being a most impressive sight, Necros knew from the creature's laboured breathing that he was, indeed, probably going to die soon. How long's he been like this? Since last night? On and off? Well, then you should have told me sooner. Necros wanted to punch Brogus, but didn't. Truth was, he'd already suspected they'd lose the Elder Dragon. What do we do now, Necros? Zuluhead will be furious. He'll have our heads atop poles. We've no choice. Get him prepared for moving. Dead or alive, we're taking him with us. Let Zuluhead do what he will. But obey orders, you simp. Brogus nodded and hurried off, whilst Necros studied the dying male a bit more and then made his way to Alexstrasza's chamber. Why do you persist in this madness? All your efforts will only lead to your death. You have the chance to save your men, and yourself. We're not craven. We're not backstabbing scum, like Orgrim Doomhammer. The Dragonmoor clan fights to the bloody end. And fleeing to the north. Is that how you fight? Macros immediately pulled the demon soul out of his pocket. That little jab obviously got under his skin. There's things you don't know, Ancient One. Sometimes flight leads to fight. There's no getting through to you, is there? Ha! <laughs> At last, you learn. Tell me this, then. What were you doing in Tehran's chamber? What ails him now? Nothing for you to worry your head about, O oh Queen. Better to think of yourself. We'll be moving you soon. Behave, and it'll be less painful. Necros then stormed off, back into the vast corridors of Grimbatol. He couldn't spend any more time worrying about dragons. At least not red ones. But he had a plan. If Deathwing arrived first, before the Alliance army, then everything was going to be fine. Because he had the Demon Soul. Surely he could use it to force the Black Leviathan to do his bidding. Force Deathwing to unleash Hellfire on the Alliance. Absolutely flawless plan, nothing to worry about. Meanwhile, Ronin woke up for the 735th time or something and decided the best thing to do would be to remain completely and utterly still, so as to avoid another run-in with the golem. But, much to his relief, he then realised the thing was nowhere to be- Oh no wait, there it is. Damn thing was playing games with him. Or was it the orc leader's doing? Or perhaps Krill had arranged this trickery. Didn't really matter that much though. Whoever was doing it was a prick. Now partly due to weakness, partly due to depression, and partly due to sheer boredom, Ronin then nodded off and started to dream. He dreamt of dragons at first, then ghosts of past companions, dwarves, and then finally, he dreamt of Verisa. Lovely, lovely Verisa. The dream itself became increasingly more vivid, so much so that Ronin then started to actually hear her voice calling out his name. It was soft and soothing at first, but when he didn't respond, she started to sound quite pissed off. Ronin! The wizard then stirred and opened his eyes, and for a brief moment felt his heart fill with hope. Verisa and Falstad. And Krill, what the bloody hell was he doing with them? But said feeling of hope was then immediately replaced by fear and dread. Look out! The golem then appeared and reached out towards both Farisa and Falstad, 
whilst the little goblin wanker disappeared from sight. It's Hans! Don't let it touch you! And then, chaos ensued, with the elf and dwarf playing some kind of high-stakes game of tag with the golem, dodging and darting about like maniacs. And at the sight of seeing his friends, but mainly just Farisa in danger, Ronin suddenly found a whole bunch of inner strength, casting one spell to break the shackles binding him, and preparing another to cast towards the golem itself. However, small calloused hands that smelled of cabbage then wrapped around his throat from behind. Naughty, naughty wizard! Don't you know you're supposed to die? Now, the lack of air did have Ronin's mind spinning for a moment or two, plus he had spent the last several days being tortured, but it was a goblin versus a fully grown man. Damn you in your magical ways! Sod this! Grill then tried to cheese it, but the fiery golem had other ideas. Turning its attention away from Verisa and Falstad for a moment, it opened its jaw, a burst of ebony fire shot out, and Krill got absolutely incinerated. The fiery golem then returned its focus to Verisa, with its jaw opening wide again. No! And Ronin, utilizing sheer will, conjured a shield more powerful than anything he'd ever created. The golem's dark flames struck the invisible barrier, rebounded, and then it exploded, causing everyone to fly back against walls and rock, whilst the ceiling itself collapsed. Another meanwhile, the dragon Deathwing was flying east across the sea, heading towards Grimbatol, smiling to himself. Everything had gone exactly according to plan. He would soon be King of Alterac, married to the King of Lordaeron's daughter, and in just a few years, which was a blink of an eye to a dragon, he'd be in place to completely annihilate humans, and dwarves, and elves, all of the shits. Suck it, Khadgar. Yet, little did he know, there was another dragon flying the sky this night. A dragon that had not flown for quite a long time, and was a little bit out of practice. But, Krasis, or rather Coriolstras, was also making his way to Grimbatol. This was it. The end game. It was not going to be simple. Despite being out in the open, Alexstrasza would still be surrounded by a significant number of orcs, and also Deathwing was a bit of an obstacle. The Red Dragon soon arrived at a secluded peak at the edge of Kazmadan, took a few moments to get his bearings, and then shut his eyes and focused on the medallion in Verisa's possession. Verisa. However, there was no reply. It had been a while since he'd left them in the tunnels. Perhaps the elf was in a precarious situation, or perhaps she was in a mood with him. Verisa, make some sound, however slight, to acknowledge that you hear me. Again, no reply. Elf. Nothing. Balls. So he'd got Ronin killed, and now he'd got these other two unfortunate fools killed as well. That was certainly going to play on his conscience a little bit. It's not too late for you, my queen. So much for the wizard. Should we dig the body up? No. Wasted time. We leave Grimbatol now. Necros and the orcs then buggered off, completely unaware that the main character of this story was still very much alive. But Ronin wasn't exactly having a whale of a time. Incredible pressure was pushing down on his head. Felt like his skull was going to explode. Ronin then shifted, trying to make himself a little bit more comfortable. But that didn't really work. However, the slight movement made him aware of something else digging into his head. A small object, perhaps a pebble. He carefully manoeuvred his hand to try and remove it, only to realise the object had some sort of magical aura to it, and upon further inspection, discovered it to be none other than the black gemstone from inside Deathwing's medallion. Huh, pretty convenient for that to be right there. But no time to overthink that, because the sounds of rocks and rubble and debris collapsing further then arose, and that was followed by a little Scottish curse. Falstad? Hey, it's about time you woke up. Have you? Is Verisa alive? Hard to say. She's too distant for me to check. How far above you are the rocks? <laughs> Currently tickling my nose, human. Never thought I'd be alive at my own burial. Ronin then went silent for a moment or two, desperately racking his brain for some solution to their current predicament. Human, if it's not too much to ask, could you maybe get us the hell out of here? Just give me a few moments. Oh, by all means. Take as long as you like. An idea then popped into Ronin's head. It was a risky one, but it's not like he had much of a choice. Faustad, I'm going to try now. That would please me to no end, human. I've got rocks in places I don't want to talk about. Okay then. Ronin then began muttering his words of power, whilst rocks above him shifted ominously. Utilising his good hand, he then started drawing a sign in the air. And then, poof, he was outside. Despite the pain in his entire body, the wizard sat up, 
checked for his companions, and to his relief, he saw Faustad and Verissa, although she was unnervingly still. Never will I ever crawl into another tunnel. There's only the sky for me from now on. Ronan didn't reply. He was too busy rising up on unsteady feet and struggling towards Verissa's prone form, and as he drew closer, she groaned. She's alive, Faustad. Was it the groan that gave it away, human? Ronan. Yes, it's me. Take it easy. I think you got struck hard on the head. I remember. Oh God, stop burying me alive! It's okay. We're safe. We're safe. The ceiling. Where, where are we, Ronan? How did we get here? You remember the shield that saved us from the golem? After the monster destroyed itself, the shield held up. Long enough to keep us from being crushed to death. It's Faustad. He saved all of us, my elven lady. Saved but dropped us off in the middle of nowhere. Ronin then looked around at their surroundings. Not nowhere, Faustad. I think I sent us to the very top of the mountain. Everything, including the orcs, lies far below us. Okay. Judging by the fact I can see you both better and better, I fear it's nearing dawn. Which means if Necros is an orc of his word, they'll be leaving the fortress at any moment. Eggs and all. Why would they do something so daft? Why abandon a place so secure? Because of an impending invasion from the west. An invasion? Where'd they get a mad idea like that? From us. From our being here. Deathwing brought me here to serve as evidence of some forthcoming attack. And Necros is mad. I imagine he already believed that an assault was imminent. When I showed up, he felt certain of it. But why would Deathwing want the orcs to leave? What would he gain? He tried to convince me that he wanted to rescue the Red Dragon Queen. But he wants to slay her. Too much of a risk while she was deep within the mountain, but in the open, he can swoop down and kill her with a single blow. And Necros wanted to leave by dawn. Is he daft? Wouldn't it made more sense to leave during the cover of darkness, surely? At that, Ronin shook his head. Necros indicated at one point in the questioning that he was prepared for anything. Even Deathwing. In fact, he even seemed eager for the Dark One to appear. Well, that makes the least sense of all of this. How could Necros possibly hope to defeat Deathwing? Well, how did he control the Dragon Queen? And how did he summon a creature like that golem? It was the artifact, Ronin thought. Had to be. However, Faustad then urgently waved for silence and pointed northwest, and as the ranger and wizard looked in that direction, they saw a vast shape in the sky. He's here. Ah, whatever's to happen, it's begun. Meanwhile, the lengthy orc caravan started to move out from the mountain, and right at the back of it, Necros trudged along with both Alexstrasza and Tehran in tow, and Alexstrasza was absolutely glaring at her captor, hatred radiating in her eyes. But Necros didn't give a shit. She could hate him all she wanted. Not like she could do anything about it whilst he held the demon soul. A smile then formed on the old orc's face. With Deathwing in his command, he would restore glory to his people. The Horde would rise anew, sweeping through Alliance lands and cutting down any who stood in their way. War Chief Necros Skullcrusher had a nice ring to it. He just needed Deathwing to bloody hurry up and get here. However, that thought was then interrupted by some weird noises. Noises that did not come from the sky. They came from the ground. And then, a whole bunch of dwarves suddenly burst out of it. We need to get down there. Can you just do what you did before? No. If I do that, I'll have no strength left. Besides, I don't know where to put us. Would you like to end up in front of an orc swinging an axe? Well, it doesn't look like we can climb down. Ah, that's just wings. Maybe he's still around. The dwarf then started rummaging in his pouch, whilst Ronin watched with utter bafflement. What are you talking about? Here we go. Faustad then triumphantly held out a tiny whistle, put it to his lips, and blew as hard as he could. Bloody forgot about him, didn't you? Soon enough, the griffin that everyone had forgotten about appeared, squawking and wagging its tail. Good lad, good lad. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go! A few moments later, the three of them were soaring above the clouds, and immediately saw a sight they'd not expected at all. There was another bloody dragon up here. It's a red one. This random other dragon also appeared to be old. Too old to have been born within the mountain. The orcs hadn't held Alexstrasza for that long. So who the bloody hell was this? Eh... Uh, should we maybe land? Ronin then scanned the area below and caught sight of Necros. The orc was holding something that gleamed bright and appeared to be pointing it directly towards this new random dragon. Well? Sorry. Uh, land over there. Okie dokie. They then landed on a nearby ridge with Ronin immediately jumping off and hurrying to the edge. 
The random dragon now appeared to be behaving completely erratically, as if battling some invisible foe, but then abruptly stopped, grew limp, and plummeted towards the ground. Is it dead? I don't know. Seemed likely that it was, in fact, dead. If the artifact hadn't killed it, the fall probably did. But they didn't really have time to dwell on that because another massive form then emerged from the clouds. Deathwing. The Dark Dragon then soared towards the Orc Column, but not directly towards Necros. He doesn't care about Alexstrasza dead or alive. He wants her eggs. The Orc Leader raised his artifact in the beast's direction. However, nothing. Deathwing didn't seem to give any shits. The Leviathan grabbed two of the wagons with surprising gentleness, turned, and then immediately buggered off causing the Orc leader to start yelling at the top of his voice. He was still holding the artifact aloft, only this time, he wasn't directing it towards Deathwing. He was commanding a very large, sickly-looking red dragon that stood beside Alexstrasza. And said dragon took off in pursuit, whilst Ronin kind of stood there wondering what the hell Necros was thinking. Surely he didn't believe such an ill-looking dragon was any match for the Dark One. I don't understand it. Surely Krasis is the reason the Hill Dwarves are finally attacking. So why is he not here with them? Ronin turned to Verisa, Again, wondering what the bloody hell was going on. Racist? What's he got to do with this? So, Verisa then went ahead and brought Ronin up to speed. At first, he didn't really believe her. But soon enough, he was absolutely furious. After he led us inside the mountain, he stopped talking. The ranger then revealed the medallion, which looked remarkably like the one Deathwing had given to Ronin. And upon further inspection, Ronin noticed the gem within it had become misaligned. So he popped it back into place. Well, Krasis, are you there? Anything else you'd like us to do for you? Perhaps you'd like us to die as well. Ronin, praise, praise be. There may still be hope. Well, that was unexpected. Crisis, are you... Listen, I must conserve energy. You may be able to salvage something. What do you want? First, I must bring you to me. The medallion then fled, and poof. Ronin was now in a different place again. Ronin then realised he was staring directly into the eyes of a fallen giant, the same red dragon that had plummeted from the skies a few moments earlier. You have my deepest apologies, Ronin, for everything. Deathwing landed, carefully set the wagons down and grinned smugly to himself. This was going brilliantly for him so far. He would need to go back and grab the rest of the eggs, though. Alex Straza was never going to be his to control, or rather bang. But surely one of her eggs would hatch into a viable female. However, as Deathwing turned to depart and grab more eggs, he saw a sickly, doddering beast flying towards him. Turan, are you still not dead yet? Give them back! And why would I do that? So they can be raised as dogs for those orcs. I would make them true masters of the world. Once more, dragonflights will rule the skies and earth. And where is your flight, Deathwing? Oh yeah, they all died. For your glory. The Black Leviathan then hissed. Come to me, Turan. I will be happy to send you on your way to oblivion. Krasis? Ronin's astonishment at the revelation that Krasis was in fact a dragon didn't last very long, because it almost immediately turned to bitterness. You betrayed me and my friends. Arranged all of this. Used me as a puppet. For which I will always have regrets. You're no better than Deathwing. That made the Red Dragon cringe. But he then nodded. I deserve that. Perhaps this is the path he took long ago. So easy to not see what one does to others. The distant sounds of battle reverberated in the background. Verisa and Faustad are still back there. And the dwarfs. They could die because of you. Why did you summon me here, Krasis? Because there's still hope in seizing victory from the chaos. You and I, Ronin. There's a chance. The wizard frowned, but said nothing. You do not reject me out of hand. I thank you for that. Just tell me what you intend. The Orc Commander wields an artifact. The Demon Soul. It holds power over all dragons. Except Deathwing. Why not Deathwing? Because he created it. Ronin turned to see a beautiful yet ethereal woman standing right next to him. Asira. The woman did not acknowledge Krasis immediately. Instead, she continued to answer Ronin's question. Deathwing created the demon soul. For a good cause at the time, so we believed. Believed so much that we did as he asked. Imparted to it some measure of our power. 
He didn't get past his own. Now a random man was approaching that looked like he had rickets. Tell him how after the demons were defeated he turned on us. He was our own power on us. He will hear what he needs to hear, Malagos. No more, no less. But yes, Deathwing pretended that he had sacrificed as we had. And once he decided that he represented the future of our kind, he discovered the horrible truth. It was in that moment that Ronin started to realize who he was talking to. They are who you suspect them to be, Ronin. Two of the five great dragons. Aspects of the world. The Seerer of the Dreaming. Malagos. The Hand of Magic. We are wasting time here. Precious time. And that would be a third. Nosdormu. Master of Time. Crisis then seemed to draw strength from the Aspect's arrival and picked himself up. You all came? Yes, we've come. But if this takes much longer, then I might perhaps go. I've much to gather. Much to catalogue. Much to babble about. Always babbling. I preferred you when you hardly spoke. Nostormu raised a withered yet strong hand towards Malagos, but Asira then came between them. This is why Deathwing has nearly triumphed. And the two male aspects then backed down and contemplated their navels. Deathwing almost had us once, but we joined ranks again and saw to it that at least he would never wield the demon soul. We forced it from his hand and into the bowels of the earth. But someone found it for him. He may well have even led the orcs to it, knowing full well how they'd use it. I believe that it suited his plan for Alex Strasser to be captured. She was the only power left that he feared. The orcs and the demon soul have weakened her. And now they've brought her out into the open. Not her. The eggs. The eggs? Yes. The last of Deathwing's mates perished in the first days of the war, slain by his own recklessness. Now he would raise our sisters as his own. To create a new age of dragons. The age of Deathwing's dragons. All four of the dragons then turned and stared at Ronin. What? I believe I know what poor Coriel Strauss here desired of you. Although it seems he will now not be the one who keeps Deathwing occupied. But I must. It is my duty. It would be a waste. You are too susceptible to the disc. No. You are needed for other reasons. Tehran now fights for his queen. And he will not survive. Alex Strauss will now have need of you, dear Coriel. Besides, Deathwing is our brother. Only right that we should play with him. What is it you want me to do? You must take the demon soul from the orc, mortal. And free our sister from his control. The three aspects then approach Gracious, each placing their hands on his face. A human cannot simply be magicked to the artifact's location. So you must bear him there, Coriastras. The demon soul took much power from us. A little more will not matter. An aura of green, blue and bronze emanated from the trio's hands. Into Crasis. I feel renewed. Just pray that it's enough. Now, we must see to our errant brother. Deathwing roared with triumph. Tehran was dead. Bloody and burned to a crisp. However, the Black Leviathan didn't get to celebrate his supremacy for very long because three new adversaries now approached. Isira, Nos Dormu, and my dear friend Malagos too. It is time to end your madness, brother. I'm not your brother in anything. Isira, you will not prevent me from creating this new age of our kind. You plan only an age in which you rule. Nothing more. Much the same thing as I see it. Go back to sleep, Isira. And you, Nosdormu. Finally pulled your head out of the sand, have you? Do you not recall who is the most powerful here? The three of you will not be enough. Your time is over. Come. Take your place in my collection of things past. At that, Deathwing just snorted. He was unimpressed. And you, Malagos, have you nothing to say to your old comrade? The blue aspect didn't respond with words. Instead, he opened his maw wide and shot out a torrent of ice. However, it didn't do any damage to Deathwing whatsoever. So be it. They won't defeat him. They cannot. Then why bother? Because they know that it is time to make a stand. Regardless of the outcome, rather would they pass from this world and watch it writhe and die in Deathwing's terrible grip? Is there no way we can help them? The dragon's silence pretty much answered that question. Great. 
Coriel Strauss. The artifact. Do you know what it can do? Many things. None of them able to directly or indirectly affect the Dark One, though. How is that possible? How long have you trained in magic, my friend? Ronin grimaced. Of all the arts, magic probably was the most contradictory. Not guided by the same rules and laws as everything else. Point taken. Ronin, the Great Ones have made up their minds. By being granted the chance to take the Demon Soul, you will free my queen. But you will also have the wherewithal to finally crush the last remnants of the Horde. Demon Soul can do that, you know. It would take way too long for me to learn how to use it. Not if you have a willing teacher. I'm not one of the five, Ronin, but I can show you enough, I think. Providing we both survive? Yes, there is that. Now, there's the orc in question. Be ready. Ronin prepared himself. Goriel Stars was not going to be able to get too near to Necros. Not without falling victim to the artifact again. Even with the blessing from the aspects. No. Ronin was going to have to use a bit of magic to reach the orc. Now! So, Ronin muttered the relevant words and started to float through the air. Directly towards its target. Necros! Human. Wizard. Thought you were dead. Well, you will be soon enough. The orc then pointed the artifact directly towards the wizard. So, Ronin quickly cast a shield spell hoping beyond hope that whatever Necros was about to throw at him wasn't as bad as the Fire Golem. But thankfully, as a giant hand of flame shot towards him, his shield held. Your tricks will not save you from death forever. True. But I only needed it to last long enough to do this. Ronin then grabbed a clump of dirt from the ground and threw it right in the orc's face, blinding the sod. And then he leapt right at him. However, he kind of misjudged the jump a little bit. Human scum, I'll kill you. The orc was still blinded, but lashed out frantically. But a large winged shape suddenly darted past, dropping something that knocked Necros on his ass, and also causing a certain golden disc to fall out of a certain orc's pocket without him noticing. The winged shape then returned, as someone atop it gripped Ronin by the shoulders. Come on, let's get out of here. No, I can't. Not until... Unfortunately, standing around having a chat had given Necros plenty of time to recover. He now looked pretty frantic, patting himself down like a maniac. Where is it? Where's the demon soul? What? <gasps> Ronin then felt a tremendous weight pressing down on him and realised his orc adversary was now standing on his chest with his one foot. Back, elf. All I need to do is lean a little harder and I'll crush your friend like a piece of fruit. No tricks, mage. Give me the disc back and I'll let you live. I don't have it. I thought you did. I've no patience for lies, human. I need it now. Necros! A look of absolute terror then formed on the orc's face. You slayed my children! Shit. And the weight on Ronin's chest was suddenly gone, as was Necros' Skullcrusher. Farisa then ran over and helped Ronin to his feet, and the two of them then stood kind of stunned at the sight of Alexstrasza. Human, you have my gratitude for finally enabling me to avenge my children. Thank you. However, there are now others who need my aid. And with that, the Red Dragon Queen took flight and flew off towards the battle between the rest of the aspects. However, Ronin couldn't help shake the feeling that this wasn't quite over yet. Surely there was something else he could do to aid the aspects further. Some way to ensure they were victorious. What are you doing? A demon soul. Necros must have dropped it or something. It has to be around here somewhere. It has to... Boom. There it was. Ronin raced over to it and picked it up and suddenly found his head jam-packed full of grand ideas. He could be master of Dalaran with this. No, Emperor of all Alliance Kingdoms. Wizard, what ails ye? Now's not the time to be standing around gawking at baubles. Faustad's sudden outburst allowed Ronin to come to his senses. There was corruption and seduction inside this artifact. Probably was a bit dumb of him to just run over and pick it up, but at least he knew that now. Ronin then held up the artifact, sensing its tremendous power, this thing was the key to defeating Deathwing. He just needed to figure out how the bloody hell to unlock its secrets. Despite throwing bloody everything in the kitchen sink at Deathwing, the Black Leviathan continued to just shrug it off. Fools, I am power incarnate. You are nothing but shadows of the past. Never underestimate what you may learn from the past, Dark One. Deathwing turned and was ever so slightly surprised to see Alexstrasza aloft. Come to avenge your consort, have you? And my children. 
I know all too well that all of this is because of you. What does it matter? Your day is past, Alex Straza, whilst mine is about to come. <sighs> I still can't beat him, even with Alex Straza, because they're all lacking what this damned artifact took from them. If there's nothing we can do, then we should leave, Roni. I can't, Verisa. I've got to do something. For her. For all of us. If they can't stop Deathwing, then who will? Faustad then joined the conversation and eyed the demon soul. Can you do nothing with that? No. It won't work against Deathwing in any way. Pity you can't just give back the magic that thing stole. At least then they could fight him on even terms. Well, that's just... Wait. That actually might be possible. Both Farisa and Faustad then watched Ronin, confused, as the wizard made his way towards a large rock. What are you doing now? Returning their power to them. Ronin then placed the artifacts on the rock. However, it remained intact. Damn it. You take it whatever it is you're trying to do isn't working. There's a spell. Members of the Kirin Tor sometimes use it to draw power from relics. But it demands that the artifact in question be shattered first. I think I can give back the dragons what they lost. But first I need this damn thing open. Eh, why didn't you say so? Stand back, wizard. Faustad then picked up a random orcish war axe that was lying around on the ground or something, took a big swing, and brought it down hard on the demon soul. However, again, the artifact remained intact, and Faustad cursed under his breath because he genuinely believed that was going to work and make him look awesome. If I had to guess, I'd say it's protected by magic. So maybe magic's the only thing that can destroy it? Seems so. But it would have to be something powerful. More so than anything I can do. Ronin then racked his brain for a moment. Something magic and powerful. Like Deathwing's medallion. That would have come in handy. If it wasn't still up in the mountain and wait. Hold on a minute. Ronin then pulled the black stone out of his pocket. The one that Krill had been bragging about. The one that he'd conveniently found right next to his head after the ceiling collapsed. What's that? A part of Deathwing himself. He created this just as he created the demon song. This should work. The wizard then spent a few minutes considering how he should go about this before deciding to just keep it simple. So he went ahead and just scraped the black gem against the demon soul. And lo and behold, that actually worked. Have you not been through enough? Why continue to fight what you cannot defeat? Because you've caused too much misery, Deathwing. Not just to us, but to the mortal creatures of this world. Oh, piss off. No one cares about them. The Crimson Dragon went in for another attack, and Deathwing laughed as she approached. Nothing could hurt him. However, as her claws tore at him, he stopped laughing. Because it did hurt him. For some reason, his entire body now aches with a pain he'd not known for centuries. What? How? Can you feel it? I'm me again. It's the end of the nightmare. Our dream has become truth. What was lost has been returned to us. The demon soul is no more. Impossible! Despite Deathwing's denial, it became immediately clear that he was now outmatched. Malagos went ahead and threw a bunch of magic at him. Nosdormu advanced time itself, forcing Deathwing to suffer days, then weeks, and then years without rest. Isira invaded the Leviathan's mind, causing him to experience countless nightmares. For the past several years, I was forced to watch my children be raised as instruments of war. Slaughtered, if they were deemed insufficient. Your words mean nothing to me. I know. Which is why I will let you experience firsthand all that I have suffered. And Alex Raza then went ahead and unleashed an absolute barrage of attacks, with her full force behind each and every single one of them. Because hell hath no fury like an angry mother. Deathwing had never experienced such suffering. In fact, it was so unbearable, the most terrible of dragons screamed like a little girl. The aspects then stopped and stared at him, kind of startled by his little girl scream, and also taking pity on him. But. They probably shouldn't have done that, because Deathwing then cheesed it. We mustn't let him slip away. Follow him. Follow him indeed. I agree. Ysira then glanced towards Alex Straza. Sister, by all means, go on. I shall join you shortly. Meanwhile, the battle between the orcs and dwarves had ended. Ronin, Verisa and Faustad had joined the fight, which had helped somewhat. But what had really helped was the red dragon Coriel Straz that had constantly been swooping down and causing the orcs all sorts of problems. So the orcs eventually had no choice but to surrender, and here we are. So what happens now? Many things. The Horde still maintains its hold on Don Gaz. And there's some political matters, which after today's events will most certainly shift. Gracious then eyed Ronin, uneasily. Just know that my kind are as much to blame for those shifts as anyone else. Okay. 
Ronin would have pressed further, but he could see Kratos didn't particularly want to go into any more detail about that. That was quick thinking what you did back there, Ronin. You always were a good student. However, that conversation was then interrupted because Alexstrasza then appeared. My queen, I had thought you dead. I mourned you for a long time. The subterfuge was necessary. It was the only way for me to be able to try and win your freedom. But I'm sorry for the pain I caused you and the inconsideration I displayed for manipulating these mortals. If they will forgive you, then so will I. Alexstrasza's tail then slipped down and intertwined with Coriel Strasza's. The others still pursue the Dark One. I would join them, but I think the priority now is to gather what remains of our flight and rebuild our home anew. I am your servant. Now and forever, my love. Alexstrasza then turned to Ronin. For your sacrifices, the least we can do is offer you a ride home, provided you can wait a little while. Thank you. The old dwarves will give you food and a place to rest. We'll return to you tomorrow, once we've recovered the eggs. Human. Elf. Dwarf. I thank all three of you for your parts in this. For as long as I am queen, my kind will never be an enemy to yours. And then, both dragons buggered off. A glorious sight, then. My elven lady, you shall always be a part of my dreams. Wizard, I've not dealt with much of your kind, but I'll say here and now that at least one of you has the heart of a warrior. Don't be surprised if you someday discover some dwarves regaling your story in a tavern, eh? Thank you, Falstad. For everything. No, human. Thank you. I'd like to see another griffin rider with a greater story than I. Will make the lady's heads turn my way, believe me. Farisa then leant down and kissed the dwarf lightly on the cheek, causing him to blush furiously. Take care of yourself. That I will. Whilst we'll all meet again, once this war's truly over. And with that, Falstad buggered off. Ronin then looked down to see a gentle hand take hold of his crippled one and lift it up. This is long past the need to be dealt with. I took an oath to keep you safe. This won't do. Your oath ended when we reached the shores of Kazmadan. Perhaps. But it seems you need to be guarded from yourself every hour of the day. And one final scene. A wizard brain trust meeting. You could have brought down everything we've worked for. I understand that now. I will resign from the council and accept my penance. If you wish for my exile, then so be it. There is some who want more than exile. But we've discussed it. Ronin's success has brought the Kirin Tor nothing but goodwill. The elves are especially pleased, so I see no reason to dwell on this. Consider yourself reprimanded, Krasus, but also... Well done. Now, the only matter left is that of one Lord Prester. He seems to have vanished off the face of the world. His shadow's empty, and his servants seem to have fled. The spells surrounding the place have dissipated too. All the other council members then stared at Krasus. It's as much of a puzzle to me as it is to you. Perhaps he realized we'd eventually bring him down. That would be my guess. Can't think of any other reason why he's fled. Well, that seemed good enough to the other wizards. Thankfully, his influence already wanes. Greymane and Proudmoor have reinstated their protest against the Ascension. King Terranus has demanded a new inquiry into the so-called noble's background. Any talk of his betrothal to the young Menethil princess has died completely. Well, I guess that ties up everything then. Shall we adjourn? Actually, there was one more thing. What is it? I'm grateful that you've granted me pardon for my questionable actions, but I must take my leave from council activities for a time. The council stared in stunned silence. How long? I cannot say. My wife and I, we've been apart for a long time. It will take a while to regain what we once had. You have a wife? Yes. Forgive me if I never recalled to tell you. As I said, we've been apart for some time. But now she's returned to me. Well, by all means. We shall not stand in your way. And with that, Krasus bowed, raised one hand in farewell, and disappeared. He wasn't completely done with the Kirin Tor, though. He would still maintain his watch over the mortal beings. And I'm done with this story, the end.